See if we get a little bit of a saturation curve and then I'll... Okay, so as people are logging on, I'm going to kick things off. Um, I'm Amy Keating, I'm the president of the Protein Society and I'd like to welcome you all to the second day of our webinar on mechanisms of molecular chaperones. Um, welcoming many of you back after yesterday's phenomenal talks for more of the same today. I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over some of the things that I introduced yesterday to those of you who may have missed this background about the society. Um, we're an international society with members in over 30 countries and each year we run an annual symposium which this year was scheduled to be in Japan. Um, the World Conference on Protein Science was supposed to be in Sapporo, Japan in July, but of course was canceled along with all other scientific events. And so now we're joining other societies in trying to explore ways of bringing people together and delivering high quality scientific content online. And so that led to the birth of our webinar series. And this is the third in a series of webinars that we've run. You can see the two previous ones here. Um, and this has been really successful, actually, and attracted a very broad audience and is working really well. So um, this is the first of the webinars that's come from our broad call for proposals to our members. Um, Reed Alderson uh, arranged today's webinar, and you could join Reed by submitting your own proposal um, and information about how to do that is provided on the website and we'll put the link for how to do that in the chat. Um, okay, so our next annual meeting is scheduled for next July and is slated to be in Boston. Obviously, we don't know yet whether it will be possible to have an in-person meeting as soon as next July. But regardless of that, we're committed to running a quality event um, either in person or online that will include great scientific content from the program planning committee chaired by Jeannie Hardy and also lots of um, networking and interaction opportunities, including for young scientists. So I hope that um, many of you will uh, participate in that event next July. Um, Another thing we're grappling with at the Protein Society is the social justice crisis in the United States, um, which we really believe requires us all to think about these issues and um, represents a call to action. So we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in the society that's chaired by Professor Bill Clemens, and we've been thinking about things that we can do to address issues of racism and inequity in science and the DEI committee is putting together their own webinar that will bring people in our field together to think about um, issues and what we can do to address them. So I encourage you to be looking out for that. Um, in the meantime, we've launched our diversifyproteinscience.org database. And this is a place where uh, protein scientists who are members of underrepresented groups can register and provide some information about themselves and their expertise. And then those of you who are organizing conferences or putting together committees are encouraged to use this resource as a way to broaden participation and to access the um, talents uh, and expertise of a broader range of uh, people. So finally, I'll just say that our call for nominations for the Protein Society Awards has just opened. Um, we give out, I think it's seven awards that are listed here for contributions in different areas of protein science. Um, 
the webinar that Reed put together here features actually five former Protein Society awardees um, showing great interest of the society in this area and the quality of the speakers that are, are here with us for this webinar. And I would encourage you to visit the website and look at um, the straightforward um, process for submitting your own nominees and trying to get them up on this list as well. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Reed Alderson, who uh, is at the University of Toronto, and he'll explain to you more about the format and protocols for today, and then introduce the speakers. So, thanks. I have to Thank you, Amy, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to friends and colleagues from around the world. Um, I'm your moderator, Reed Alderson. I'm at the University of Toronto, a postdoctoral fellow in Lewis Kay's laboratory, and oops. Um, welcome to our second and final day of our webinar on the mechanisms of molecular chaperones. Um, we had great audience participation yesterday, so please keep it up with your questions for our speakers. We're lucky once again today have a, to have a great lineup of speakers. Um, they're listed here in alphabetical order. Our first speaker uh, will be Paul Shonda. Paul received his PhD from the IBS in Grenoble in 2007, where he worked in Bernhard Brucher's laboratory. During his PhD, Paul spent some time at the Weizmann Institute working in the laboratory of Lucio Friedman, who is actually Judith Friedman's brother. Uh, so it's a small world, and of course, we'll hear from Judith later today. Paul played a key role in the development of the now very popular NMR pulse sequences that enable rapid acquisition of multidimensional NMR spectra, otherwise known as the so fast and best type of pulse sequences. After his PhD, Paul moved to do his postdoc at ETH Zurich in Beat Maya's laboratory, where he trans transitioned to solid state NMR. Paul has since played a large role in developing cutting edge solid state NMR approaches to study protein structures and dynamics. And since 2011, Paul is an ERC funded group leader in Grenoble where he combines NMR, cryo-electron microscopy and other structural and biophysical methods to unveil the molecular mechanisms of chaperone action. I'm excited to hear what Paul has to share with us today. And Paul, the floor is yours. Oh, Paul, you're still muted. Okay. Thanks a lot, Reed, for putting together this very nice program and for inviting me to present today. I'm going to talk about mitochondria. And mitochondria are known as the powerhouse of the eukaryotic cell. And they're actually involved in many different processes, such as Krebs cycle or urea cycle. And it takes more than 1,000 different proteins to actually perform all these different tasks. But actually only a handful of them, five or so or 10, are actually synthesized in mitochondria. And more than a thousand different proteins are synthesized outside mitochondria in the cytosol. And so there is a complex machinery which imports these proteins into mitochondria and then inserts and refolds them into the right compartment, either into the matrix or intermembrane space, so in aqueous phase or in the membranes. And this is gonna be the focus of my talk today how mitochondrial membrane proteins are um, transferred by a class of chaperones. So there has been um, at least four decades or so of, of excellent biochemistry uh, and in vivo work where um, a number of groups have identified the components of this machinery, of this import machinery. And so basically it consists of um, chaperones in the cytosol, which would take over these precursor proteins or pre-proteins um, at the ribosome, transport them to translocases, and then a further chaperone will then transport these um, membrane proteins either to the inner membrane or to the outer membrane where they are inserted into the membrane. So we know a lot about the biochemistry, but we know actually very little about the molecular mechanisms. And so I'm gonna to talk today in particular about the TIM chaperones of which you see one here, which is called TIM910. And it is the main chaperon that transports membrane proteins across the intermembrane space. And they had actually been crystal structures. So there are actually two different ones. One is called TIM910, one is called TIM813. And you see here one of the crystal structures, which is a hexameric structure. So you have two copies of TIM9 and uh, three copies of TIM9 and three copies of TIM10. And although there had been a crystal structure, it's actually very difficult to understand uh, 
how this chaperon would actually transport membrane proteins, for example, these two guys here. Um, this is an inner membrane mitochondrial carrier. It's the ADP ATP carrier. And this is an outer membrane porin. Actually, the structure had been solved by Sebastian a couple of years ago. And so if you look at those, it's not easy to understand how this would work. And in contrast to the chaperons that we have seen yesterday, this is a membrane protein chaperon. So the client is inherently insoluble in water. So the chaperon does not want to refold and then release the protein, but it actually has to transport it. And so this is kind of contradictory, or that there are two contradictory requirements. This complex between the chaperon and the membrane protein must have a very, very high affinity so that the membrane protein would not fall off the chaperon. But at the same time, once this complex arrives at the insertase, um, there shouldn't be a significant energy barrier to actually release it. And then there are other puzzling things. For example, this chaperon is actually relatively small. It's about 70 or 60 something kilodalton. And its clients are up to 60 or 70 kilodaltons. So there are mitochondrial carriers which have folded domains. So they are about 70 kilodaltons. And then there's all kinds of topologies from three helices to four helices, to six helices, unfolded tails, folded domains. So we really don't know how this actually works. And so there had been a lot of models out there um, about the possible function. And you can see here a couple of models, for example, that the membrane protein would actually bind inside the cavity formed in the middle of this hexamer or somehow down at the tentacles, or that the hexamer would completely fall apart and then either intercalate helices of the client or basically completely fall apart and bind like beads on a string. Experimentally, this is not really easy to solve because the first problem is already how do you actually prepare this complex? So in vivo, the pre-protein would basically exit the TOM complex and the chaperon would kind of wait there and find the precursor protein as it exits the channel. But in vitro, that's complicated because the pre-protein is highly insoluble, so it needs some detergent or denaturant. But the chaperon is actually very sensitive to denaturant, so how do you actually make them meet? And this is where Katharina started off her PhD. She developed, she tried a couple of methods and basically developed this kind of a pull down approach where this precursor protein would be denatured and bound to a nickel affinity uh, resin. The denaturant would be removed, the chaperon would be added, and then she would elude the complex. And you can see here on the gel, this is what we get. This is the complex of TIM910 and precursor protein. So this is where we can actually start doing structural biology. And as already yesterday, we are extensively using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And there's a good reason for that because NMR provides us with hundreds or even thousands of local probes located at each atomic nucleus. And these probes tell us about the local environment around this nucleus. We can play some simple tricks like selectively labeling only part of the molecule, so in this case, we're looking at the amide NHs. Uh, so you get a two-dimensional spectrum, nitrogen and proton frequency. Here we would label leucines and valines or alanines. And so we get very specific and localized probes of what's going on. If we can assign them, we can actually learn something about structures, confirmations, including the averaging of confirmations, as well as direct insight into dynamics. So for example, in this TIM910 chapron, this is the kind of information that we can get very easily. This would be an experiment that probes the backbone flexibility. It's called heteronuclear ennui. And you can see that these tentacles are actually highly flexible while the core is rather rigid. We can do different tricks. Like here we would measure the flexibility of side chains multiplied with some overall correlation time of the tumbling. So this would tell us that this particular alanine 67 would be very rigid, while this particular leucine 28 is highly flexible. And it also tells us that this molecule has a tumbling time of about 40 nanoseconds, which perfectly matches what we expect for this size of the molecule. So when we did nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy of this complex in black, um, no, the, the APU chaperon in black and the complex with two different membrane proteins, either the GDP-GTP carrier or the ADP-ATP carrier. 
we can immediately see that there are spectral changes. You can see that many of the intensities are really dropped uh, uh, quite a bit. We also get spectral changes in terms of shifts, chemical shift changes. Some peaks are completely gone. But what we clearly see also is that in the complex, there is only one set of resonances. And this immediately tells us that the hexamer remains symmetric. Any symmetry break of this hexamer would lead to a doubling or triplication of peaks. Um, we can also see that the spectrum changes, but there is not a dramatic change, which, which means that the structure of the chaperone is not dramatically changed. So we can use this knowledge and immediately rule out a couple of models that have been out there where the chaperone would really fall apart. We can also tell that the complex is certainly not a complex where the client would sit statically at one side of the um, chaperone because this would again break the symmetry. And we know that we have symmetry or a spectrum that reveals symmetry. So we must have something where the client dynamically samples many different conformations on the chaperone. So we can then move on and identify the binding site of the client on the chaperone. And we did a couple of different experiments. I highlight only here one, where we would kind of selectively irradiate nuclear spins of the precursor protein bound to the chaperone and then this magnetization would spread over to the chaperone and we can identify those residues which have a detectable effect and those must be close to the client. And you can see this kind of profile here. And the residues with the strongest effects are located in a groove formed by the inner helices and the outer tentacles helices. So this is the binding site for the mitochondrial carriers. We went on and did experiments for outer membrane proteins because this chaperone also helps outer membrane proteins. And we actually failed preparing complexes of the full length uh, protein, but we did succeed in um, preparing complexes with a small peptide, a cyclic peptide, which is actually, which corresponds to the two last strands of VDEC. And this peptide basically binds to the same site. You can see here chemical shift changes, so it also locates into this uh, groove formed by the inner and the outer tentacles. Interestingly, if you're not taking this uh, cyclic peptide, which had been shown to form a beta turn structure, but you take a linear one, then the chemical shift changes would be very small. And you can see that um, here, where we plot the chemical shift changes. So clearly you need a cyclic peptide. And this can be understood because the cyclic peptide would basically form a hydrophobic phase and a hydrophilic phase. This is also confirmed by cross-linking experiment done by Tobias Joris in, in Doran Rappaport's group, where you can see that the linear peptide doesn't quite as well cross-link to the cyclic peptide compared to the cyclic. So what is this cleft that we have identified experimentally? Basically, it corresponds to highly conserved or relatively well conserved um, hydrophobic residues um, in between these inner and outer tentacles. So you can see that these hydrophobic conserved residues match very well to the binding site that we have identified. So we teamed up with uh, Niels Wiedemann's lab in Freiburg and Caroline did a lot of in vivo experiments where she did single point mutations of residues in this hydrophobic motif. And at least to my surprise, many of these mutants where you have a single residue mutated were lethal to yeast. We checked, of course, that the chaperone is still intact. So these are NMR spectra, gel filtration profiles. So the chaperone is intact. It is really just the removal of one hydrophobic side chain and replacement by a hydrophilic or charged side chain, which would basically um, disrupt the complex. This, of course, also uh, then shows up in substrate import um, experiments, where you can see here, for example, that you get much less of the ADP, ATP carrier imported compared to the wild type protein. In vitro, we can do the same experiments or kind of similar experiments with mutants. We would do our, our pull down assay. And while you get client protein in the complex, in the case of wild type protein, you basically get no complex anymore when you have single point mutations. So clearly this is the binding site. This is also showing up here in this peptide, VDEC peptide experiments where you have much lower affinity. So now we know where it binds, but we actually don't really know what the client looks like. 
And so we went on and specifically labeled the client on an unlabeled, so NMR invisible chapron. And what you're seeing here in orange are spectra of the membrane protein precursor, either for the backbone or the, for the methyls, isoleucines in this case. And I compare them to spectra recorded in urea or in the micelle, where this protein is in an alpha helical conformation. And comparing these spectra, you can clearly tell that the membrane protein precursor is not in a completely unfolded, highly flexible conformation or state, because then it would more resemble the spectrum in urea. And this, for example, happens in Sebastian's um, SKP complex uh, bacterial chaperone. So this is clearly not the case. We may suspect that there is some kind of a helical conformation left. And this is actually confirmed by CD spectroscopy, both for ADP, ATP carrier and GDP, GTP carrier. We get a little bit more of the alpha helical signature in the complex. But as you have seen, the spectra are relatively bad in terms of lines, line width. And so we suspected that there is some millisecond dynamics going on, which would broaden resonances. And this is a textbook uh, example or kind of, uh, of NMR exchange. So if you have very fast exchange between different conformations, then the chemical shift of all those conformations would be averaged and you would see a, a single uh, peak. If you have very slow exchange, you would see individual peaks and somewhere in the middle, it gets complicated. Lines get broad. And even though in many cases, you may not actually be able to detect these minor conformations, the fact that this peak that you can detect is broadened tells you directly about the millisecond exchange in terms of kinetics, populations, and chemical shifts. And we do this with an experiment that is called CPMG, which I will not describe here, but basically tells you that wherever you have this kind of profile, which is not flat, like here and here, we do have millisecond dynamics. Whereas in flat cases, we do not have millisecond dynamics. And you can see that these dynamic residues, they cluster again to this hydrophobic binding cleft. We could fit the time scale of this exchange, which is about 1.5 1, 1 um, milliseconds. And of course, it's, or we would expect that it's the same kind of time scale, whether we do this experiment detecting Jepron or whether we do it, do it detecting the client protein. And this is exactly what happens. So we have some kind of a common process, millisecond dynamics, but we don't really know what it is. So there could be two options. There could be dynamics within the complex, or it could be some kind of binding and release, possibly transfer of the precursor protein from one chapron to the other. So this can be tested very easily because you just need to prepare a non-isotope labeled complex, mix it with isotope label APO chapron, and in the end, you would end up with a mixture where you have some of the labeled chaperon uh, being complexed uh, with the precursor protein. And then you would see spectral changes and you can follow those in real time by NMR. And basically this experiment revealed that it takes a couple of hours to transfer a precursor protein from one chaperon to the next. In other words, the millisecond process that we are seeing cannot be on and off. It must be within the complex. So we need to little, get a little bit more information about the shape of this complex. So we determined the size. And um, interestingly, by analytical ultracentrifugation, diffusion experiments, and also NMR, rotational correlation time experiments, we consistently find out that the size of this complex is about two times the size of the APO chaperon. So somehow we must have two chaperons complex um, to the client protein. We can test this because if, it's, if it takes two chaperons to bind a 300 residue protein, then maybe if you chop it in the middle, you would only recruit one a chaperon. And this is exactly what happens. So here we took only two transmembrane helices and we get a monomer, which is slightly bigger, of course, than the APO protein uh, because the pre protein is bound which basically means that we can rule out all the models that had been out there. Um, and we need to move on and uh, did SACS experiments. And these SACS experiments tell you kind of an instantaneous snapshot of the molecule. And of course we know that we have a lot of dynamics going on there, but nevertheless, we did a first kind of a naive approach where we would just model the envelope 
And you can see that there are clearly two kind of blobs here, which would correspond to the two chaperons that we know that are in our complex. And so we teamed up with Kristen Lindorf Larsen and Yong Wang, and they actually did an analysis of this SACS data that explicitly takes into account dynamics. So what they did is they start out with different confirmations. They would sample those for a couple of microseconds, and then they would reweight these confirmations such that the resulting curve would match the experimental curve. And so this is kind of the way you should think of this complex. So we have the precursor protein bound to this hydrophobic cleft. You see here in red, these hydrophobic residues, and it is highly dynamic. There may be some secondary structure left, some alpha helix character may be left. This is not coming out of our MD simulation, but of the CD experiments. And so it's clearly a highly dynamic complex. Now this is only half of the story because in mitochondria, there is actually not only this team nine chaperon, but there is also another one which is called team 813. And you can see here the architecture, which is basically the same as the architecture of team 910. So you have, three copies of team eight and three copies of team 13. And we did the same pull down experiments with GDP, GTP carrier, and just basically measured, we did different kinds of competition experiments. We measured how much we get of GDG, GTC1 in complex with either this one or this chaperon. And it turns out that this chaperon is about five to 10 times better as a chaperon for this membrane protein than team 13. So how come? Well, if you look into the um, sequence, then you figure out that in this hydrophobic cleft, there are two hydro hydrophilic residues in team eight. And we suspected that those would uh, reduce the affinity of the client protein to this hydrophobic cleft. So we mutated them and indeed you get more complex in this double mutant than in the wild type team 13. But what we found really intriguing is that if we take another membrane protein, TIM23, which has about 100 residue long disordered tail, then TIM813 rather than TIM910 is the better chaperon. So we know that TIM813 is less hydrophobic in its hydrophobic binding cleft. So how can it be a better chaperon for a membrane protein? TIM23, um, this IMS fragment, this N-terminal fragment is indeed an IDP, it's a disordered protein, you can clearly see this from its NMR spectrum. And when you titrate in team 813, then you can see that many peaks are gone, indicating that those interact with the chaperon. Um, in contrast, if you do the same experiment with team 910, then there are only very small changes, just a few residues at the very end terminus, which um, disappear or which shift. And this is also mirrored in uh, ITC experiments where we do get uh, an affinity about 60 micromolar uh, for team 813, but we cannot detect any binding for team 910. This binding, actually the few residues that do shift, they're actually at the very end terminus where you have a couple of hydrophobic residues. And so we expect that those would actually bind to the hydrophobic binding cleft of the chaperon. And this is exactly what you see. Here is a chemical shift mapping. This time we look at the chaperon and you can see that this, the, most pronounced effects occur in the hydrophobic cleft. This is uh, very reproducible if you use not the fragment, but the full length protein. So now we do a pull down experiment preparing the full length protein. Um, and you can see that basically the same residues that disappeared in this fragment alone also disappear in the full length protein. We do not get any additional uh, peaks that would correspond to the transmembrane part. And we believe that like in the case of GGC1, there is a lot of dynamics going on in this hydrophobic cleft, which would leach out the residues. And again, in TIM910, only a couple of residues would shift. This is also mirrored um, in the experiments that this time detect the uh, chaperon, where you can see um, in the full length TIM23 in complex with the chaperon, you would see effects in the hydrophobic cleft and we believe that this is the transmembrane part of the client protein, which is bound to this cleft. Whereas in the case of 813, um, you have more diverse uh, shifts. You can basically get shifts all over the place, uh, including the top part where you get very small shifts only in T19. So we need to find out before we can actually say something about the structure, we need to find out something 
about the size of this complex. Remember, you had we had a two to one complex with GGC1. So we had two chaperons that are being recruited by GGC1. In this case, we only get one chaperon. This is consistent with a couple of different experiments. And so we again went on and measured um, sucks. And we actually tried to fit two different confirmations. In one confirmation, the N-terminal tail would be bound to the top part of the chaperon, because we know that here is the binding site at least for TMA13. And in the other confirmation, we would have the N-terminal completely flexible. And then again, as before, we would do an extended uh, MD simulation and try to see how well these confirmations and the back predicted sucks curve uh, would fit our experimental sucks data. And it turns out that if you take only this end tail unbound confirmation and you try to fit this to team 813 data, so this is the blue curve here, it doesn't fit very well, which is what we expect because we know that team 813 does interact with the end terminal tail. So you need a mixture for team 813, you need a mixture of at least 85% of this end tail bound confirmation and only 10 or 15% of this open confirmation. Whereas in the case of team 910, it's rather the opposite. Uh, you need at least 75% of this unbound state. You can actually take then the KD that we have determined with ITC measurements um, for this fragment, for this team 23 fragment, which is about 60 micromolar, and you could predict what would be the population that you expect um, for this complex. And indeed for team 813, you would expect at least 75% of this bound confirmation based on the 66 micromolar. So this is fully consistent. And it also tells us that the N-terminal tail is doing more or less the same thing, whether it is in isolation, so just this fragment, or whether it is in the context of the full length um, TIM23 protein. We can at least tentatively try to identify those residues or those interactions that kind of drive this interaction this between 813 and 23 and between 910 and 23. Now, of course, for the transmembrane part of the membrane protein team 23, it's clear, it's this hydrophobic cleft. But what is the difference between these two when it comes to this hydrophilic uh, experiment, uh, hydrophilic interactions with the N-terminal tail? And um, from the MD simulations, we can identify a couple of negatively charged residues in the team 813 um, complex, which are not there. So here you see the difference between team 813 and team 910. So you can see this negative patch here. And at least in the MD simulations, this negative patch would interact with positively charged, in particular lysine and arginine residues in the N terminal tail of team 23. So what is the take home message um, for this membrane protein chaperons? It is clear that these complexes are highly dynamic. So the membrane protein binds to this hydrophobic cleft. It is hydro highly dynamic within this cleft, but also in this particular case, the tail is very dynamic. And this hydrophobic cleft actually provides multiple interaction sites. And this resolves kind of a um, apparent contradiction, namely how this complex can have a very high affinity, yet the release would be very efficient. And this is also not the first case that somebody speculates about this. This has been beautifully shown by Sebastian on, on the SKP um, OMP complex, which also uses um, avidity of, of interactions, transient interaction, to provide high um, affinity. However, compared to SKP, we would clearly have a very different architecture because the membrane protein sits on the outside rather than somewhere in this kind of central pore of this chaplain. And this TIM23 example shows how additional hydrophilic interactions can basically fine tune the specificity. So we, we get more TIM813 rather than TIM910 binding to certain clients um, compared to only transmembrane proteins. With this, I'd like to finish and thank the people that have been involved in all this work. So what I've shown you today is um, Primarily the work of Katarina and Eva during their PhD thesis, together with Audrey, Dorian, Ons, Beate. Um, and we had great uh, chance to, to collaborate with excellent people doing very different things from MD simulations in Kristen Lindor-Blasen's lab, 
Sachs uh, here in Grenoble locally at the synchrotron, Niels Wiedemann and Caroline Lindau did all the in vivo experiments and Doran and Tobias did the cross-link. And I'm very happy to take your questions now, which I believe Reed will read out to me. Yes, that's, that's true. And thank you, Paul, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a question here from Carol Post at Purdue. Um, for the spectra of the client bound to TIM 813, many of the peaks disappear without the appearance of new peaks. And so how do you interpret uh, the conformation or dynamics of that bound substrate? So did I get it right? It is the peaks of the chaperone that disappear? Um, I'm not entirely sure what Carol was asking. She, I guess she's maybe she is referring to the chaperone. Why the bound state resonance is not observed? Okay, so these are really so there are two effects why these peaks are broadened. You can particularly see this for um, GGC, less for AAC. Um, so one reason is that the complex gets um, at least twice as big. So it, the the APO complex is the APO chaperone is 60 kilodalton. The complex is about 150 kilodalton. So in terms of correlation time, this increases quite a lot. Plus you have this millisecond dynamics. Um, and you can actually see by comparing these two, the time scale is a little bit different for the dynamics of AEC within the hydrophobic roof than for GGC within the hydrophobic roof. And so we get, actually get more broadening of in this GGC state than in this AEC state. Thank you, Paul. And actually, uh, Carol just clarified. Thank you, Carol. She was wondering actually also about, about the substrate. So the, the bound substrate, the peaks are disappearing yeah. and you don't, you don't see new peaks. So how, nope. what does that mean? Well, I believe that, I mean, this is the highly heterogeneous, plus it has a lot of millisecond dynamics going on. I think this basically bleaches out the peaks. And we tried a lot to, to do CreNAPT and to do, try 3D HNCO and all kinds of experiments. And basically we got stuck with a simple 2D correlation. That's all we can get. And finally, one more question from Christian A.M. Wilson at the University of Chile. Uh, in the CD experiment, you showed that the protein clients have more secondary structure in the presence of TIM. Um, do you think it's a full base or is it just some the inherent secondary structure in the bound client? So I think secondary structure is important for binding. Um, and actually, we have shown this directly for the case of this VDEC peptide, where you need secondary, where we, you need to basically have one more hydrophobic um, site and one more hydrophilic phase. And so for a better turn, this is the case. But also for alpha helices, so mitochondrial carrier have kind of a central pore, which is hydrophilic, and they're hydrophobic toward the outside. So they would certainly bind better to this hydrophobic cleft if they are in a helical conformation where this hydrophobic residues would point in one direction, which would be the direction towards the membrane in the folded state. So I think that Chapron induces some degree of secondary structure. And then if I could use my moderator privilege just to ask one question. The complex you showed is very tight. So you don't have any exchange between substrate and chaperone once it's formed. So is there some other chaperone that comes in and takes the client away from Tim to actually to put it in the membrane so it can then fold? Um, so I have to correct you a little bit. Maybe this was not clear. The chaperon can act, or the precursor protein can actually be transferred from one chaperon to the next. Mm -hmm. But arguably, not very slow. It, it takes, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not a biological time scale. Um, to me, it's not clear yet how this works. But in principle, this complex is highly stable um, unless you start pulling on one side. There is no energy barrier to actually stop you from pulling it because it's only very short lived and transient interactions that keep the complex together. Mm -hmm. So an insert taste can basically just pull it off, but of course we don't know how this works and this will be very interesting. And thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and we will now move on to our second speaker. So <laughs> Sebastian Hiller will be talking and Sebastian obtained his, obtained his PhD in the group of Kurt Butrick at ETH Zurich, where he developed advanced solution NMR methods to characterize folded and unfolded forms of proteins. As a postdoc, he moved to Gerhard Wagner's lab at Harvard Medical School and Sebastian determined the structure of the human mitochondrial VDAC channel. Uh, since 2010, Sebastian's a professor at the Basel Biocenter, where he started his independent research group, and he has been awarded an ERC starting grant and an EMBO Young Investigator Award. Um, he was named associate professor in 2015, and his research applies advanced NMR methods to unravel the mechanisms of bio macromolecules. 
And key focuses in his group are, of course, molecular chaperones. So I'm very much looking forward to Sebastian's talk today, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks, Reid. Um, uh, and thanks for this very, very kind introduction. And actually, Reid, I want to really thank you for taking the initiative and putting this meeting together. It's, it's brilliant to do this and great service to the community. Bring us through this time of social distancing. That's really, really super. And thanks, of course, for inviting me to be a part of this. We've seen great talks yesterday and, and already before, Paul, and um, I hope I can also give a good talk here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. So my lab is uh, interested in, in biophysical principles of chaperone functions. We really want to understand not only what chaperones are doing, but we, we try or hope we can understand the biophysical laws behind it. So we want to know how they work and why exactly they work as they work, why they interact with certain clients in a certain way and not in a different way. And then, of course, what are the evolutionary constraints that are brought by these biophysical laws? And this is what, what we hope to, to achieve. Um, my talk today will, will consist of two parts. Um, in the first part, I would like to review um, some of the work we did in the, in the past 10 years or so. And I would like to highlight um, three key findings that we now learned based on a number of systems that we have studied, a number of chapter of client systems. And at the end of this first talk, I would also come up with an interesting working concept that has occurred. And I would like to share this with you and then maybe also ask for, for your feedback on that. In the second part, I would like to give a, an outlook on ongoing work in my lab where we use um, te enema techniques combined with, with uh, ATP regeneration to study a very complex chaperone uh, system, uh, uh, HSP70 system at unprecedented um, temporal and, and spatial resolution. I would like to show how we do this and give an outlook on, on this work that is not yet finished, but uh, that hopefully is going to come at one point. Okay, so for the first part, I would like to motivate these studies um, on, on molecular chaperones with this picture gallery of, of chaperones. And this was a bit the situation that, that presented itself to us in about 10 years ago. There were many beautiful crystal structures available on chaperones. And um, we have here, here the whole days, more simple ATP independent chaperones on top, and then more complicated chaperones that act in functional cycles here at the bottom, Glory L, HSP60 type of chaperones, HSP90, HSP70, and also some other uh, machines. And we were really wondering how do chaperones interact with, with their clients. And um, we then decided, and this was a bit the strategy that we did, to initially focus on these more simple systems that come from bacteria um, that are ATP independent because we can handle them very well in, with, with uh, animal spectroscopy and potentially get complete resolution of the client protein in the chaperones and we hope we learn something from them. And um, it, it was not at all clear at, at the time how the client proteins would interact with the chaperones. We have now seen this. This is more and more apparent that it's indeed in dynamic ensembles and this was uh, the, the key first key finding I would like to share with you that, that this is a re really now established and we, that we know that, that this is how the, the chaperones interact. So how, where did we learn this? We learned this from our early studies of, of Skip and it was actually nice to see that Paul has, has continued this kind of work on chaperones that transport, un, that transport unfolded membrane proteins. So Skip is a bacterial one. It sits in the bacterial periplasm in gram negative bacteria and brings unfolded outer membrane proteins across the periplasm. We have studied two different client proteins. These are beta barrels in their folded form. They will then be inserted here by the bump complex into the outer membrane. But in SKIP, they are in the aqueous solution and SKIP brings it across the periplasm. The crystal structure was available at the time. And I will not go into all of the details of the work because it's, of course, published for, for a long time. But I want to highlight two, three very important things. So the first thing is about symmetry. And it was actually also nice to see that in Paul's talk that this has reoccurred in the TIM system, we, we managed to, to get the entire complex of the skip chaperone with a full length client and, and as, uh, observe the entire complex. So we can observe both the chaperone and the client at full atomic resolution. We see every single residue. Um, and this allowed us to make some, some unique conclusion. And the first conclusion we can already see here, we have the skip here on the left side in the APO form. So we see here only the skip chaperone. We see a complete set of resonances for all residues. And then we see it also here in the holo form when it has the client OMP bound. The OMP is a 
16 kilodalton unfolded membrane protein. And again, we see just a single set and a complete set of resonances. And this immediately um, tells us that there's huge dynamics going on because the C3 symmetry that we have, of course, in the um, APO state, skip is a homo trimer, is maintained in the holo state with the OMP bound. And OMP is, of course, not having itself a C3 symmetry. So that means this apparent C3 symmetry that comes here, that we see because we have a single set of resonances, comes across uh, due to dynamic averaging of the individual protomers on the um, fast NMR time timescale, meaning up to microseconds. And despite any local interaction will be asymmetric, the overall uh, time averaged environment that each subunit sees is the same. This already bears a lot of conclusions. If we then look at the substrate, and here's the animal spectrum of the substrate when it's bound to SKP, and in this case OMBX, one of these outer membrane proteins, we again see a narrow chemical dif dis shift uh, dispersion, and we see a single set of, of lines. Um, and that now tells us again that there's dynamic averaging going on in this spectrum, and it's a bit similar to <laughs> what, what Paul saw in this talk just before. It resembles the OMPX in, in eight molar urea. So we have a narrow chemical shift dispersion. That means we have fast conformational averaging um, when the chaperone is bound to skip. If this was in, in a single conformation, in a unique one conformation bound to the chaperone, we would see for sure certain resonances that are outside this narrow chemical shift dispersion. And we would, of course, also have a broken symmetry on, on the chaperone. So already from these uh, considerations, we know that there's dynamic averaging of the conformations going on. Nonetheless, we did at the time really determine um, the dynamics of the chaperone bound client to, to demonstrate and to prove that this is over flexible and aver averaging over multiple conformations. And we do this here by a space called spectral density mapping. And in this experiment, we measure the dynamics of the client protein at different time scales, at different frequencies. And there are three frequencies. The lower two are actually the fast nanosecond to picnic second time scale. And this upper density is J of zero, corresponds to the global molecular tumbling. And thanks to the, the fact that we see all the residues, we can now resolve this in a per residue basis. And we see pretty uniform behavior. So you can see here that for all the residues, um, we have on these two time scales, which are the fast time scale, approximately the same value of the spectral density um, with some local fluctuations, and then also in a similar way here for the global tumbling. And this compares again very nicely to the um, outer membrane protein when it's denatured in, in the 8 molar urea, urea chemical denatured. On these fast time scales, they have very pretty similar um, uh, um, um, spectral density, so pretty similar motion. This is the local sampling of the Ramachandran um, space here. Here's again, we, we give you, show you only the, the average values. This is again pretty uniform in urea. It's pretty similar here. But then there's a big difference for the J of zero function because, of course, the chaperone at the client is coupled to the molecular tumbling of the chaperone. This uh, then also um, made already clear that we have a dynamic ensemble and we use now the paramagnetic relaxation. Enhancement effect PRE to determine the spatial extension of this ensemble. We can see here um, with certain measurements, we put a spin label here at position 140 and could by this then determine in first order approximation how, in which spatial volume this, this uh, polypeptide is constrained to. And we see that if we, we do the same experiment in 8 molar urea solution here on the right hand side, we see very little long range effect. So from the spin label here at position 140, we don't have a strong effect all the way. So this is in a random coil configuration and eight molar urea is very much extended. But here we see long range effects. So in the chaperone, this polypeptide ensemble is very much compacted. And so overall, we came up with this dynamic um, ensemble description at the time. We have long lifetime of the complex, but very fast um, reorientation of multiple conformations inside the chaperone. This is all done by avidity, many, many non-specific local interaction. Um, and actually, um, there's actually a suggestion to Paul how this can get off very quickly. We thought about this as well at the time because we have here for the skip chaperone the same situation that our membrane protein is delivered to the insert phase and then released. And each um, of these OMS contain, contains a special signal sequence that is specifically recognized by the insert phase. So this may be the way how 
You can then, from a pool of interconverting configurations, pick out a specific sim signal that has a local, very high affinity because it's a specific affinity. Will immediately go to the translocase case, uh, to the insert case, and then because it's dynamic, it can easily and very quickly go go out of this. Is what we suggested for the palm, and I assume it would be the same for the SAM and the, and the mitochondrial space. Okay, so. This is the, the end of this first uh, conclusion that we, we made at the time already, and I'm glad to see this is now more and more observed for, for many, many children clients who see that actually we have bound clients in a conformational ensemble where we have interconversion on the chaperon surface. This means a large conformational entropy, and that means we can get a pretty high affinity without having a very strong um, interaction enthalpy, and that means, of course, we can get these high affinities without the specificity. That's what we know for many of the general chaperones. Now here's the classical situation where we have a single conformation, a classical protein-protein or protein-ligand interaction, where we need very big specificity to get a high enthalpy because we have a low uh, conformation and entropy. So it's great to see that now all the descriptions move into this, this direction here. And we showed this actually also at the time, and I will quickly point this out, that also for the other um, bacterial chaperone, sec B, trigger factor, sir A, we can always see this very dynamic and narrow banded spectrum of OMP A that without much extra work already tells us that um, there is no special secondary or other structure. And from the narrow line, which we see that is again highly dynamic. Okay, the second part I would want to highlight is the recognition part. How do chaperones recognize clients and what we saw and also others so this um, is that actually chaperones repeatedly um, recognize and bind to exactly the same, or can not say exactly, but largely the same areas on client proteins. And I'm showing here a comparison of the spy chaperone. This looks like this, and the stir A chaperone and the skip chaperone, three of these ATP independent um, periplasmic chaperones, and they each of them recognizes the client, model client protein IM7 in a very similar way. You see this here by chemical shift perturbation maps. The ball we can recognize the same side that is here highlighted in, in gray, which is up here. And actually, for the partially for I'm saying this is the, the region that is locally frustrated. Um, we also see this on other clients that this seems to be the, the preferred side of interaction for chaperones. And then also for unfolded version of the same protein, chemical shift perturbation maps look pretty similar, and we recognize each of these chaperones despite their very different architecture recognizes the same side. We then used actually this knowledge to um, also understand how chaperones in general interact with alpha synuclein. Um, the, the, this is the, the protein that is relevant in Parkinson's disease. And we could see that the bacterial chaperones, just as the eukaryotic ones, HSP70 and HSP70 variant and HSP90, they all bind the N terminus here in a consistent way and also this region around Taurus in 37. Um, and this allowed us some very interesting insights in, uh, in, in living cells, which you can, can read up in, in this publication. So that, this commonality is, is uh, very important. And I'm also showing here the functional assay that any of these bacterial chaperones, as well as the eukaryotic human one, is able to um, strongly retard alpha synuclein fibrillization. Um, here's the, the controls and um, here are the, the different traces for the different chaperones. And this is at a one to 10 substitute. And actually this assay, there's so many other assays out there when, and, and published that actually there's a lot of transferability between the different chaperones. So you can replace in functional assays very, very frequently one chaperone by another one. And so also these more simple um, bacterial chaperones can in many cases do more complex folding tasks that are otherwise done by more complicated machineries. Not always, of course, we have seen the beautiful work yesterday from Rina uh, Rosenzweig, who, who showed that um, for, for certain complicated jobs, we need specific, specific machineries, but still there's some commonality between the chaperones. And in this case, they also bind all very similarly to, to synuclein, despite the fact that, of course, the bacterial ones, skip and SECB, have never seen an evolution this, um, this client protein. Okay, the third thing, um, I would want to, to highlight or, or point out is uh, that we have seen this in studies of the chaperone spy and with the client IM7. It's a beautiful system um, introduced by, by Jim Bartwell, who also did a number of, of, of great studies on this. And 
um, as I said, this recognizes here this frustrated side. And what we saw is that this interaction, and here's an ensemble description of the complex, so these are different conformations bound to the, to the chaperon. This interaction now denatures, destabilizes the IM7 protein. We see this by here three different parameters. So on the one hand, we've increased dynamics on the fast um, picker to nanosecond time scale and on the entire protein, so this heteronuclear NOE that we use in NMR to measure this, fast dynamics goes up. That means um, this is much more flexible. We lose secondary structure in this difference plot. You can see this, we lose a few percent of the helicity because all of these go up. And then also the proton deuterium, uh, so the amide proton exchange on the entire, in the entire protein is increased. So here in gray is the normal form of IM7 without the chaperon. We still have quite some protection in certain places in the protein when the chaperon is around and binds to the client in this dynamic way, then suddenly we lose all this protection. So this denatures the, the client. And a similar denaturation effect is actually seen in, in multiple, has been observed multiple times for multiple Chaperons. Here's an example from actually Paul Shanda is one of the corresponding authors on this paper from the Guagovie lab. Um, here we see in, in HSP60, uh, when egg white lysozyme being uh, locally, uh, being denatured partially, so this is destabilized by the um, uh, chaperon. And similar things have been reported for HSP70 by at least two labs, and then there's more here. That, uh, it's not a complete list of all these observations. For PROEL, this has been observed, and also for HSP19, some small HSP that have uh, a client destabilization. So these, these were the three things. And um, I was then wondering if we put these together, so we see that the chaperons destabilize client proteins thermodynamically. This is very important. These destabilizations, also here, they were in the absence of any ATP, so these are in thermal equilibrium. We solubilize aggregation prone peptides in aqueous solution and we keep clients in, in highly dynamic ensemble states. And this actually, even by definition, renders uh, these molecular chaperones um, as, as chaotrops. And I think to me, this is an interesting working hypothesis or an interesting work concept um, to think of, of chaperones as chaotrops. Um, and yeah, I would be, be glad to have your feedback. Uh, any, anyone out there, please send me an email if you want and have, uh, tell me what you think about. Okay, and for the rest of the time, I would like now to go one level up, let's say, and switch to more, one more complicated system, HSP70, which uh, we already have heard um, yesterday about and we'll hear more later today. It's a beautiful system, HSP70, one of the most important chaperones in cells. And we have been started to be, to be interested in the um, version of HSP70 that is sitting in the ER in the endoplasmatic reticulum. This is also called BIP. And BIP um, is, uh, has, has been, BIP in particular and HSP70 have of course intensively started since many decades even um, due to their enormous functional importance. And a lot is already known and I'm just listing, listing here very few exemplary works. There's, there's much more, we have here something, a nice work from Johannes Buchner work yesterday. He has, uh, Marina and, and also from Lila Giras lab, there's great work already in this. Dio Mas is the postdoc in my lab who is um, spearheading this and he wants now to use, in, increase the, the temporal and spatial resolution that we can achieve with this system and study its functional cycle. So what is known is that HSP, this HSP7, this BIP has an ATP bound state. So red here is the ATP, this bounds, and then it tests this substrate binding domain docked here to the nucleotide binding domain. The nucleotide binding domain is blue. And um, then it can switch by ATP hydrolysis losing phosphate. We have here now ADP. And at this stage, this uh, um, part is undocked. The substrate binding domain has a high affinity for the client. And we can go now through a circle. And there is also exchange factors, nucleotide exchange factor here that can speed up potentially this process and the J protein that can speed up this process. And we wanted to look at this more carefully here, I'm quickly showing that constructs we are using, these are constructs that are generally known for these proteins. It's a BIP itself. We have a BIP version where this linker is mutated um, such that the allosteric communication between the two domains is gone. And we can, of course, have a truncated version where we have only part of the BIP. We use uh, this ERDG6. We can now use it in full length. We 
um, because in NMR, of course, we, we, we do not rely on crystallization or something. We have a full length with some flexible parts. Also for this bulb, this nucleotide exchange factor, we use the full length part and, and we have a pseudo inclined. And the way we do this now and is we use an ATP regeneration system. So we have um, pyruvate phosphate and pyruvate kinase that constantly re-phosphorylates um, ADP to ATP. And that means over time, over many hours, we have a constant ATP level in the cell while this PEP is decreasing over time. And so our molecular machine, and in this case, our BIP is constantly switching back and forth. And um, we can therefore not only get high spatial information because we can observe all the methyl groups that are here in this protein. Every of this, each of these dots is a probe that we observe. It's a huge amount of observables here, but also from the kinetics of this, um, of this enzymatic um, decay, we can get the length now of the functional cycle and the length of the individual subcycles. And so by doing this, we get both high spatial resolution, essentially atomic resolution information. You can see here that the nice spectra that we get in this and at the same time, we get information on the, on the site. And here, a short note that it was really hard work for Guillaume and, and still is to make all the assignment. He assigned now more than 80% of all these methyl groups in all the states, um, which allows us this, this very interesting insights. And I wanna show now only, as I said, this is an ongoing work. I wanna show now three things that we have observed and that we think are, are new to this cycle. And, um, one is uh, that we see uh, can now resolve an allosteric connection between the nucleotide binding site and the client binding site. This has to, to our understanding not been resolved so, uh, in this way so far. So um, we do this by comparing um, spectra between differently truncated uh, mutants. So we can remove here this linker and the uh, uh, substrate binding site, and then we see that there's an allosteric coupling going up here, and we connect this with the mutant of the, of the linker. And then we see that the chemical shift perturbation goes all the way here. So we see a, a coupling all along this side. This is the first thing I would like to show. The second thing is this question, if the, this substrate binding domain is here docked to the nucleotide binding domain, this is, it has here this contact. We can see this, of course, in all the chemical shifts that are down here where that's docked or not. In addition, we can see it by NOE, so we can observe direct NOEs between uh, these two domains and prove whether it's docked or not in a certain situation. And when we now match this with our observation of the nucleotide itself, we have a very interesting finding. So in the nucleotide binding domain, we can see um, that we have about here 40% ADP bound state and 60% ATP bound state, but this does not match up with the percentage of undocked and docked protein that we read out in the resonances of the SPD. So we do have now a third state. So we know that also in the ATP bound state, there is an undocked conformation to some extent. So this, this uh, adds to the, to the known cycle where only two states have been there before. And the third thing is that this um, uh, speed up factor, so the, this uh, enhancement factors, the nucleotide exchange factor, the, the J domain, are in, in this setup now working really well. They speed up the cycle dramatically. So the, the, the BUP, the nucleic tight exchange factor, speeds it up by four times and the J domain by 20 times, times. And we see this now that the client, uh, the, the functional cycle is dramatically shortened. And for each of the um, phases, we get the individual length. So this is, has not, not seen that far. There have been much lower. Uh, speed up factors. So far, so far, we use phi as a nomenclature for the kinetic enhancement. And so this is what, where we stand at the moment with a more refined cycle. We also want to look better at atomic resolution at the exact interactions. And I hope we can report this at any time soon in a, in, a, in a manuscript. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. I would like to thank very much my group. There's a great team of people. Um, just here on our recent group retreat and the persons that were specifically involved in the work I showed today is Guillaume who spearheads, as I mentioned, the HSP uh, 70 work together with Johanna and, and Anna who also do great work on these auxiliary proteins. Björn Burman has been a long collaborator for the first part, for a long part of our chaperone work. Initially he's now faculty in Gothenburg and Lee Chun-hee has also done the, the spy work, and he is a faculty now in Wuhan 
Chinese Academy of Science. We had a great collaboration with Roland Rieck and Juan Jerez on the Synuclein work, and I would also like to thank my funding sources, and I would thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sebastian, for a very stimulating presentation. And while the questions are coming in, um, oh, here we go. There's a question from Andrew Savinov at the University of Washington. Um, it's a, a broad question. Have you observed that clients are able to destabilize or unfold the chaperone based on changes to the NMR spectrum? Um, perhaps there are cases where a class of chaperone can actually interact with one client, but in another case, it might be destabilized by another client. That the client unfolds the chaperone. Um, yes, that was it. That, that's interesting. So there is a, whole, a class of chaperones that is actually active as an unfold in an unfolded form. So this wraps around substrates. Um, and what we also know is that skip now is actually in the monomeric form intrinsically disordered. So it self unfolds. But I'm not aware of any case where the client actually unfolds the, the substrate. But it's an interesting thought and may, may actually happen in nature somewhere. And we have a Christian question here from Christian Wilson from Chile. Uh, what was the client for the BIP study? For the BIP study, um, this is shown here. Um, yeah, there's a very good point. This is a CH1 is a, is a common client in, in the BIP field. What we actually see, and this is important to, to say, I, I didn't mention, is that the client has hardly any effect on the functional cycle. So we see this here, the BIP alone, um, basically, whether a client is there or not, the PIP is a machine, it just runs. And um, yeah, that's an interesting. And maybe I can ask the final question. Uh, you showed you have the two states and most likely the third state where it's, I believe, ATP bound, but undocked. Um, do you have any information maybe on the time scale of that exchange process? Because it, it looks like it must be slow, the docked to undocked conversion. And then uh, the third state, I must have missed that. Yes, yes, yes. No, um, so we, we think that the, the intercon, well, we can at this moment not access the, the time scale between interchanging between those two. We can quantitatively measure the, the length of each of the um, phases. So these may be in fast exchange. So this ATP bound state may actually be now in a continuum of states between docked and undocked states. But for sure, what we can say is it's not the case that we have only this state and only this state. So there must be something else. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for your presentation. Thanks a lot. And next, we will have a presentation by Judith Friedman. And Judith obtained her PhD in Buenos Aires uh, studying biochemistry. After her PhD, she joined Ulrich Hardo's lab when it was at Sloan Kettering in New York. And in, during her postdoc, Judith discovered the eukaryotic chaperonin trick and unveiled new insight into co-translational folding of proteins. Judith has since become professor and the Donald Kennelly Chair in Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. Her lab has made many seminal discoveries over the years, including early observations related to the partitioning of misfolded proteins into distinct quality control compartments, as well as elegant structural and biochemical insight into the function of TRIC. And Judith's work has been recognized with many awards, most notably the uh, 2014 Dorothy Hodgkin Award from the Protein Science. A protein Society. And thank you, Judith, for your presentation. I look forward to hearing about it. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes. Good. Okay. So thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, share my work with you. I'm going to... Can you see my screen? Yes, everything is perfect. Okay, good. Let's hope it stays that way. Okay, so I am uh, going to tell you today of our efforts to understand the chaperonin uh, trick CCT in the cell. And uh, I, why is this not working? Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little. Okay, so uh, we, we've heard uh, several talks already about the role of chaperones in uh, helping protein folding. And I, uh, I show you this slide to put in perspective that the role of chaperones happens in the context of a larger proteostasis network where proteins are translated on ribosomes. They are sensed by chaperones, both for folding and denaturation. And if folding doesn't, uh, happen successfully, then they are uh, transferred to clearance pathways. 
Now, this function is uh, approached from many different uh, chaperone systems that are structurally and mechanistically distinct. And what I want to tell you today is our efforts to understand this ring-shaped uh, chaperonin here uh, that in eukaryotes it's called trick. Bacteria and mitochondria have a slightly different version of this ring-shaped complex called bacteria in E. coli Groyel, which are quite different, and I'll mention these. So I'm first going to give you an overview of our current understanding of the mechanism of this chaperonin, and then I'm going to tell you a, a story about the cooperation between this ring-shaped chaperonin and another chaperone that works together with it that is called GIM or prefolding, and that actually has some similarities to the skip chaperonin we just talked about. So, uh, okay, so why do, does the cell have so many different classes of chaperones? So why do you need to have one ring-shaped chaperone? So TRIC has a number of structural, uh, unique structural features that translate into unique functional features. As I mentioned already, it's ring-shaped and it has this back-to-back -back stacked rings uh, structure. Each of the rings has a central chamber, so you could think of this double ring structure as creating a nanocontainer. If you turn this around uh, uh, 90 degrees, you see that the entrance to the central chamber in each ring is blocked off by a built-in lid that opens and closes in a highly allosteric ATP-dependent reaction. Now, while uh, Groyel is a homo oligomer, and many of uh, Trig CCT's archaeal cousins are also homo oligomers. The eukaryotic chaperonin is an obligate hetero oligomer. And I'm going to tell you a lot more about why we think this chaperone evolved to have this hetero oligomeric nature. So there are different but related subunits in a fixed arrangement uh, around each one of the rings. And, uh, my lab cooperated with Rudy Ebersold and Uri Hartel's lab to show that this arrangement is fixed and conserved from yeast to man. Now, this unique structure of TRIG is important because TRIG has a unique ability to fold a set of cellular proteins that cannot be folded by any other chaperone. This includes actin and tubulin, but many other proteins with complex topology, including FBOX proteins, uh, DNA repair enzymes, and also viral proteins. And it also plays an important role in suppressing the amyloid aggregation of a number of uh, neurodegeneration-linked proteins, including Huntington, as well as alpha synuclein. Now, uh, how does the structure of uh, TRIC look like. So, so here I'm giving you an overview of the ATP-induced closed state of TRIC uh, compared to the ATP-induced closed state of an archaeal chaperonin from Metanococcus maripaludis, which is a homo oligomer. And both of these, you can see, are, have quite a conserved overall architecture. If you look at each one of the eight subunits of the ring, you will see it also has a very conserved subunit architecture. Each subunit is composed of three domains, an equatorial domain that is responsible for ATP binding, an apical domain that is responsible for substrate binding, an intermediate hinge domain that communicates ATP induced changes throughout the entire complex, as well as the lead segments that form this little beta-stranded iris in the closed state, but are fully unstructured in the open state. So uh, work from my lab in collaboration with the labs of Hua Chu doing cryo uh, 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 and also Paul Adams doing crystallography for the archaeal chaperonis uh, showed uh, the structures of the chaperonin in the open and the closed state. And what you can see is that in the open state, the central chamber is fully accessible. The apical domains are, well, looking upward in the structure, but they are probably highly dynamic and flexible. The substrate binds inside the central chamber. And ATP hydrolysis promotes closure of the lead and encapsulation of the substrate inside this central chamber. And the substrate uh, from 
both biochemical, from biochemical experiments, we know faults inside this closed chamber and we need the closed, the enclosed nature of the chamber uh, is uh, essential for folding. So in a way, this is like an isolation uh, uh, chaperone. It's a good chaperone for the times of uh, this pandemic. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, turn my attention to our studies trying to understand the subunit diversity in trig function. And to make a long story short, uh, uh, all of these studies point to the fact that the heteroligomeric nature of trig evolved to generate a symmetry in a seemingly symmetric chaperone. And this uh, 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 insight came from work of several people in the lab, work from Stephanie Reisman when she was a grad student cooperating with Lukas Rahimiak when he was a postdoc, showed that there is great asymmetry in the affinity for ATP among subunits in, it, in the ring. And we see that two of the subunits, CCT4 and CCT5, bind ATP very readily. Two of the subunits, one and two, bind ATP with lower affinity. And three of the subunits uh, don't seem to bind ATP uh, with any appreciable affinity. Interestingly, these form two uh, uh, hemispheres within the ring. Interestingly, experiments in yeast done by Brian Chen when he was in the lab showed that if you delete the ability to bind ATP in yeast subunit CCT4 and 5, the cells are dead. If we delete the ability to bind ATP in, in CCT1 and 2, the cells are very sick. But you can delete the ability to bind ATP in these three subunits and the cells are perfectly viable without any phenotype, suggesting that ATP usage segregates asymmetrically between the two hemispheres of a single ring. Work from Lukas Yachimiak also when he was a postdoc, and this was uh, done in great part through NMR experiments, so this is my NMR uh, panel uh, for the talk, showed that the substrate binding sites of of the different subunits in the apical domains have very different chemical properties. And furthermore, uh, Lucas showed that each one of these uh, different binding sites will recognize a different element in substrate, suggesting that in this case, uh, the asymmetry of between subunits is exploited to generate a polyvalent combinatorial recognition of polypeptides. Finally, also work from uh, Lukash, when he was in the lab, showed that when the chamber closes, the environment inside the closed chamber is asymmetrically charged. So here I'm showing you a view from inside of the chamber looking out into the lead, and you can see that one hemisphere is negatively charged and one hemisphere is positively charged, and this charge asymmetry is uh, conserved from yeast to human. Now, uh, all together, uh, together with work from Nick Douglas when he was a student in the lab, have generated this model of how TRIC uh, interacts with substrates, how it exploits subunit diversity to generate a very specialized, unique folding machine. So the substrate binds through individual motifs to different subunits within the open chaperonin uh, generating a, a certain topology that orients the bound polypeptide even when it's bound to the chaperone. This may already set, allow certain folding intermediates to form disfavoring other types of intermediates. Then uh, the asymmetric nature of ATP hydrolysis together with the fact that the chaperonin releases the substrate via local contacts between neighboring subunits may also generate an ordered release pathway that directs the substrates along specific trajectories. Of course, this is a model, but last year, David Bolgin and Uri Hartl uh, uh, published a structure of acting bound to trick that substantiates some aspects of this model. And in data, I don't have time to show you on published data, we are uh, continuing to test this model using uh, a number of different trick substrates. But the interesting uh, 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 suggestion from our experiments is that trick may 
have evolved to actively promote certain productive folding trajectories while disfavoring others, and this may be one of the reasons why it can fold proteins that other chaperones cannot fold. Now, I want to tell you a story about uh, the cooperation of FREAK with other chaperones within the chaperone network. And uh, this story actually started many years ago. This I took from a review from Bern Booker written 20 years ago, which suggested that uh, uh, FREAK can cooperate with two different chaperone systems, the HSP7, the HSP40 chaperone system that we heard about a lot, but also a different type of chaperone called prefolding or GMC that we haven't heard about from uh, in this symposium and I'm going to tell you a bit more about. So this is similar perhaps to skip a jellyfish-like heteroligomeric chaperone complex and as shown here in this uh, schematic it was thought to act as a pre-folding, hence its name, to facilitate substrate transfer to trick. But there was no clear mechanistic studies and it was also dispensable for viability. So uh, uh, Dan Gestaut, a postdoc in the lab, decided to look at what's the role of this gene prefolding in the trick folding cycle. And in order to do this, Dan did something that has been really very useful uh, uh, for the field, which is he generated two recombinant systems to generate human prefolding and human trick. And this has opened the way for us to make mutants and purify them, which otherwise has been really very hard to do. So here I'm showing you an experiment where uh, Dan takes human recombinant prefolding and human uh, trick, binds them in a native gel and titrates the affinity of trick for human prefolding. This is the band in this non-denaturing gel that corresponds to the trick complex binding prefolding, and this is excess prefolding. And from this, we could see that there was an uh, uh, optimum one-to-one -one stoichiometry of trick prefolding binding. So trick is symmetrical, has two rings, but prefolding seems to bind preferentially to one ring. And using fluorescent polarization, Dan also showed that prefolding binds to uh, uh, trick in the open state and that closure of lead and here we lock the lead closed with ATP aluminum fluoride uh, actually releases prefolding from this complex. So uh, leading us to this conclusion. Now uh, is prefolding a prefolding? So in order to test this Dan made a prefolding acting complex and then added purified trick in the presence and absence of ATP. This is a gel where we are only looking at radioactive actin. This is the radioactive actin in a complex with prefolding. You see when we add a uh, trick, even without ATP, actin will jump from prefolding to trick. And when we add ATP, now actin is folded. Now, uh, if uh, we start uh, from the trick actin complex, we had a surprise because when we add prefolding, the actin can jump back to prefolding. So there is no specific directionality in the trick prefolding interaction. The substrate can be transferred bidirectionally. Now, does prefolding affect the kinetics of uh, uh, actin folding by trick? And I uh, have to mention that actin is a really nice and useful substrate because uh, trick uh, actin has an obligate requirement for trick for folding. So uh, 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 when we add uh, actin to trick, it will bind and it will fold in an ATP dependent manner, as you can see here. The kinetics were interesting because there seemed to be biphasic. There was one rapid phase. And then no matter how long we waited and trick was hydrolyzing ATP, there was no more uh, efficient folding of actin. Now, if we pre-bind actin to trick and then add prefolding, something interesting happened because the second phase was highly accelerated, both in rate and yield. And when we looked at, uh, for instance, what happened to actin at this time point, which is where we are already in the second phase, slower phase without prefolding, you can see that we start to see actin aggregation, even though it's still binding to trick, and prefolding not only increased the yield, but disfavored aggregation. So 
the uh, uh, conclusion of, of this type of kinetic experiments is that prefolding can work after trig bounded substrate to prevent aggregation and enhance the folding yield. So maybe more than acting as a pre-folding, it seems to act as a processivity factor for trig, like in pro-folding or co-folding. So how does this work mechanistically? So for this, we collaborated with the lab of Hua Chu, and uh, this was work done by his grad student, Po Shui uh, Ma, and uh, uh, Han Ro, who now has his own lab in Korea. So we uh, 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 did single molecule, single particle reconstructions of three uh, uh, prefolding complexes. And at the beginning, we had a very hard time seeing prefolding. And the reason why we had a very hard time seeing uh, prefolding is because, as Han discovered when he did uh, uh, classification and then looked at different classes, prefolding bound to treat in many different conformations. And here you can see that when we do these class averages, we can perfectly see the jellyfish uh, uh, shape prefolding on top of treat, and you can see that in uh, each one of these classes, prefolding becomes progressively more engaged with trig. And we can tell which subunit is which in trig, and you can see that in all of these conf configurations, prefolding is binding to uh, primarily trig CCT4. So this is a movie that is an interpolation of our different classes, and this suggests a mechanism by which prefolding docks on trick and then rotates to become engaged with trick. Now, there is evidence that the substrate binding site of uh, prefolding is in the central chamber. And as I told you, the substrate of trick uh, also is in the central chamber. So the, 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 the idea here is that the two chambers of these two chaperones will become aligned in the most engaged state. OK. Uh, Sorry. Okay, so in order to make a model of trick and prefolding, because they, we couldn't tell which subunits of prefolding were interacting with the different subunits of trick, or even if there was a preferred uh, interaction mode, we turned to cross linking mass spectrometry, and this was work from Alex Leitner uh, uh, in Rudy Eversold's lab. And then we did computational modeling to dissect the complex. There was one preferred uh, uh, configuration of uh, trick in a complex with prefolding. Incidentally, this also allowed us to figure out the arrangement of the subunits of prefolding in the complex, which also wasn't known. So now that we had a defined arrangement, we could use these distance constraints and the EM to build a model, which is shown here in a movie that intercalates all the different uh, 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 states that we observed by EM. Now, what's interesting is now that we have a, a structural model of the trig prefolding complex, we can make some conclusions about the properties of the complex. And what was really interesting is that when prefolding binds to trig in the open state, so the chamber is open, you can see that it, in a way, ex extends and modifies the properties of the chamber in which the substrate is enclosed. So here, again, I'm showing you the view that the substrate has from inside the chamber, looking towards the outside where prefolding is bound. This is the APO state. This is the prefolding bound state. You can see that the electrostatic properties of the prefolding chamber start to configure discharge asymmetry faced by the substrate, and also it generates an asymmetric polar, nonpolar type of environment. So what we think uh, fr from this model is, sorry, that by buying prefolding, it changes the properties of the chamber, and this may actually return the substrate to productive uh, 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 to a productive folding pathway, and maybe this is why it enhances the rate and yield of fold. Now, how can we test the effect of uh, the prefolding binding to trick in uh, vivo? So 
we, we wanted to define a little bit better the binding site of prefolding. So here I'm showing you in yellow dots the regions of the apical domains that interact with prefolding progressively in the different classes. Here I'm showing you the two extreme states, the large state and the engaged state. You can see this is CCT4. So what Dan did is he actually purified recombinantly all the apical domains of the TRIG subunit, and he found that just the apical domain of CCT4, which here I'm going to call AP4, can compete away binding to prefolding to trick. So that seems to be the major binding site for prefolding in the trick complex. Now, what's interesting is if we look at the interface between the two subunits of prefolding, four and six that interact with CCT4, you can see that these are negatively charged in prefolding and that CCT4 has an outside patch that is positively charged. So when Dan put negative charges in this positive charge, now there was no longer any competition for prefolding by to trick and of course apical domain ap 4 with the triple e does not bind to trick so this suggests that the interaction between prefolding and trick is driven by electrostatic interactions between cct4 a patch on the outside of cct4 and these negatively charged patches in between prefoldings four and six which allow it to pivot now, we use this insight to test what happens if we disable the interaction of trick with prefolding in vivo. And I mentioned to you that you can delete prefolding in yeast and the cells are perfectly viable. So what Dan did is he used CRISPR to change this positive patch. So this is a view of the open complex from the top to a negative patch. If we do this and we can do this in vivo in yeast, you can see that yeast will still assemble a trick complex. So these are native gels of yeast lysate. And if you add ATP aluminum fluoride, you can still get the close conformation with migrates faster. However, when we have a trick triple E, let's call it a variant versus the wild type in CCT4, this trick no longer binds prefolding. This is a little pull down column and you can see the triple E doesn't bind prefolding trick does by prefolding but the charge is the interaction is so sensitive consistent with an electrostatic interaction so what's the effect now of disrupting prefolding uh, trick interaction while having the two complexes so first we looked at viability these are drop tests in yeast at three different temperatures here i'm showing you if you delete prefolding five, so that doesn't allow prefolding to form. The cells are still alive. They grow really well at 30 degrees. They're a little bit sensitive at cold and higher temperatures. Interestingly, the, having a trick that cannot bind prefolding is completely, not completely, but the cells are really, really sick. So it's almost lethal. You see, we get almost no growth. Interestingly, if in the background of this chaperonin, we delete prefolding, now the cells come back to life. And if in this trick uh, that has CCT4 triple E uh, without prefolding, we now re express back prefolding subunit 5, the cells are again very sick. So, what this really uh, suggests is that blocking prefolding binding to trick renders prefolding toxic to the cell. Uh, what uh, then Dan uh, did is find that many proteins aggregate, many ribosome biogenesis factors, mitochondria, as well as other chaperones. So there might be a pleiotropic effect, and we are now trying to continue to understand the interplay between trick and prefolding in vivo. But what was very clear is that if you delete prefolding, there is not a lot of aggregation in vivo. This is looking at aggregation via proteostat staining. So that's a thioflavin T type derivative. But in the CCT4 triple E mutant, there are lots of prefolding uh, uh, proteostat positive functa that are abrogated by deletion of uh, prefolding. So, as a summary of what I've told you today, prefolding uh, uh, works together with trick via an, a, a, a conformational cycle that is driven by an electrostatic interface. It's not necessarily just a prefolding, it seems to be a processivity factor. Maybe it acts both before 
and after, and it helps cycles of productive folding. It also uh, uh, changes the environment properties of the substrate binding chamber, returning the substrate to a productive uh, folding pathway. And in vivo, there is cooperation between trick and prefolding to maintain optimum proteostasis. And when prefolding is gone, there must be other chaperones that pursue. So just uh, to, to summarize what I've told you so far, uh, TRIC is a very uh, highly evolved uh, chaperone that exploits its uh, heteroligomeric nature to generate a symmetry in many of its functions, allosteric regulation, nucleotide binding and hydrolysis, substrate binding and folding. So the chamber of TRIC is a lot more than an isolation chamber. And I also showed you that the subunit heteroligomeric nature also imparts specificity on cofactor interactions. And of course, uh, th there are many very uh, cool questions to, to keep investigating. How do the substrates actually fold in this chamber? How did, does this very unique complex assembly in the cell, how did it evolve for this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, type of uh, uh, subunit? arrangement, how does it cooperate with other chaperons and cofactors. And I also want to mention that TRIC doesn't just fold, work together with other chaperones, it interacts with the ribosome to promote for translational folding. And Kevin Stein, a postdoc in the lab, had a paper recently looking at the co-translational co function of TRIC. Uh, it also may be regulated through signaling pathways and may work very differently in different cell types. And another postdoc in the lab, William Bong, also had a paper looking at the differential expression of TRIC in neurons and neuronal stem cells. So there are lots of really interesting questions uh, for the future. Okay, I'm done. I just need to acknowledge. So uh, all the trick prefolding story I just told you was done by really a very talented postdoc, Dan Gestalt, who is now in the job market. So uh, uh, you can reach out to him. And the EM was done by Boshue Ma, a, a student in Wachu's lab, and Son uh, Han Ro, who is now has his own lab. Uh, in Korea. Uh, the work was started by uh, Lukas Joachimiak, who also now has his own lab at UT Southwestern. As I mentioned, we have a very long, uh, multi-decade uh, collaboration with Wachu, who just moved to Stanford. The proteomics, we got a lot of help from Ron and Abiner, a postdoc in my lab. And also, I have to really thank Alex Leitner in Rudy Ebersold's lab with whom we have collaborated also for a long time on cross-linking mass spec. And that's that, that this is the website of our group. And uh, I just will end with an advertisement for our own uh, alternative proteostasis seminar series every Wednesday. And I, these were some of the speakers and uh, I invite you to join us. And that's that, thank you. Thank you very much, Judith, for a wonderful presentation, and thank you for postponing the Proteostasis Consortium until next week. Um, first question from Fabrizio Chitti from the University of Florence. Is there any evidence that TRIC client proteins have evolved their sequences to have specific interactions with TRIC or the intermediate states during TRIC-driven refolding? Yeah, this is really a fascinating question. I think this is something that would be very interesting to look. I mean, my uh, intuition is that some of them, at least some of the obligate substrates of TRIC, have co-evolved with the chaperonin. And actually, uh, Lukas had, uh, and this is, was in his paper, a very interesting uh, correlation between the number of chaperonin subunits in archaea, so in archaea, which are the closed cousins of TRIC, uh, there are archaea that have homoligomers and archaea that have up to four different chaperonin subunits. And if you look at the size of the archaeal proteome, and then it grows linearly with the number of chaperon, chaperon, different chaperonin subunits. So I think this is a very interesting question. I also have to say from Kevin uh, Steins and Allison's uh, data, uh, looking at co-translational function of TRIC, some of the substrates of TRIC are, you know, probably not obligate. So a lot of glycolysis enzymes, enolase, alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, a lot of mitochondrial import precursors are TRIC substrates. Perhaps those have not evolved specific features and, and maybe TRIC having many subunits allows TRIC to expand 
its repertoire and its functions as a chapter. Thank you. And just one final question uh, from Tessa Sinehi at Utrecht University. Does prefolding also promote the anti-aggregation activity of TRIC towards substrates such as poly-Q proteins or alpha synuclein? Uh, yeah, the, the, I don't. I think there is also a paper for alpha synuclein. There are papers. Uh, I think there is at least one paper showing that prefolding can suppress Huntington aggregation also. And I have to say, one question we don't yet know is whether prefolding only works works with trick or if it has additional functions other than folding with trick. Very interesting. And thank you once again, Judith, for your presentation. There's some extra thank questions in the Q&A box. Okay, um, thank you. And we will conclude today with a presentation by Ulrich Hartl. And Ulrich studied medicine at the University of Heidelberg from where he received his medical degree in 1982 and then a PhD in 1985. Following his postdoctoral work at the University of Munich and UCLA, where he made important contributions related to mitochondrial protein import in Walter Neupert's lab, Ulrich then started his own laboratory in 1991 at Sloan Kettering, before becoming the director of Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in 1997, where he remains to this day. And Ulrich has made many seminal discoveries about the functions of chaperones throughout his career, including pioneering studies of the chaperone in Groyel. And indeed, Ulrich's laboratory has elucidated many of the steps in the chaperone mediated protein folding process. And I think it's particularly interesting to take a step back and remind ourselves of the early days of the chaperone field. For instance, when looking back at one of Ehrlich's early papers, I encountered a sentence from the abstract of a paper in 1992 about the successive action of DNA, J, K, and Groyel, where they wrote that this sequential mechanism of chaperone action may represent an important pathway of the folding of newly synthesized polypeptides. And I think that this is particularly illuminating because it was something brand new at the time, but students, of course, now learn this in textbooks around the world today. It's great to see how much the field has developed since then and all the progress it's been made. Ulrich's work has been recognized with many prestigious awards and just to name a select few, his election to the German National Academy of Science as well as the US Nas National Academy of Sciences. And he was the recipient of the 2006 Stein and Moore Award from the Protein Society, the Lasker Award in 2011 with Arthur Horwich and the Breakthrough Prize in 2020 in Life Sciences with Arthur Horwich. So Ulrich, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Reid. Can you, can you hear me well? Is it okay? Yes, everything is, yeah. and the slides look Pleasure great. to be part of this uh, excellent seminar uh, series. It's, thank you so much for organizing it. So I want to uh, continue along the theme that chaperones, is in particular ATP-dependent chaperones, can play a more active role in the folding process and actually promote folding. And I will uh, illustrate this with a recent work that we have done on two major ATP-dependent chaperones, namely the HSP-70 system and the chaperonin. This is for the uh, bacterial system, the DNA, KJ, GRPE system, and the uh, GRUEL, GRUES system. And I hope to be able to convince you that, that uh, there is really a new conceptual understanding emerging, whereby uh, it becomes clear that these two chaperone systems uh, cater to different subsets of the proteome uh, of, of uh, proteins with different folding problems that they cooperate in this process and that this explains why cells actually contain these two types of major chaperone machines that seemingly do uh, the same type of job. Now this uh, work I'm talking about is mainly done by these three individuals. Rami and Amit are just about finishing their PhD in David. Uh, has left a couple of months ago, was a postdoc in the lab working on the uh, trick chaperonin and also did some work on the mechanism of actin folding. He now has his own group as, at the Greek Institute. And uh, all this work was in very close collaboration with uh, Manajit Hayahata. Now, uh, we understand, of course, and we've heard in several of the talks that the major function of chaperones is to prevent protein aggregation reactions, either to amorphous aggregates or to a fibrillar type of, of aggregates that play a role in uh, various neurodegenerative diseases. But it is also becoming clear more recently that uh, chaperones can uh, promote folding at different uh, places, different parts of the uh, folding energy landscape. They can actually uh, modulate the folding energy landscape and this can result in accelerated folding reactions. They can uh, help to uh, interconvert partially folded states that may be kinetically trapped in perhaps aggregation prone conformations and uh, convert them back onto a, a productive folding pathway. And this raises, of course, uh, many questions. We like to understand how chaperones uh, 
function in this type of uh, promoted protein folding and uh, also why do certain proteins have an absolute requirement for a specific chaperone system. Uh, Judith just gave a wonderful example of actin that is strictly dependent on the trig chaperonin and it cannot in fact use the uh, bacterial GROVEL uh, chaperone system, chaperonin system, even though uh, it functions by a somewhat uh, similar uh, mechanism. So there is clearly adaptation of substrates to particular chaperones which then solve uh, specific, uh, specific folding problems. Now, uh, the major theme of today's talk is uh, that HSP-70 and the GROEL chaperonin, in this case, cater to proteins with different folding problems, HSP-70 rescuing stably misfolded states, and the chaperonin promoting folding of more dynamic folding intermediates, which are populated by a certain subset of proteins. Now, in the cell, of course, and we have heard about this, uh, folding has to be understood in the context of translation. It begins co-translationally in the bacterial cytosol nascent chains. The majority of cytosolic nascent chains will interact as they emerge from the ribosome with a uh, uh, first set of uh, chaperone, first component called trigger factor, and longer nascent chains subsequently interact with the HSP70 system, DNAK being the major HSP70 homolog. At this stage of the translation of the biogenesis, the nascent chain is not yet able to fold into a stable structure. It is uh, topologically restricted also by the ribosome, structurally incomplete, may form uh, transient secondary structure, maybe small tertiary modules can form co-translationally. But the function of these chaperones is that uh, by binding to hydrophobic chain segments of this type, they prevent uh, premature misfolding of the nascent chain and through cycles of binding and release, uh, in the case of 70, HSP70 being ATP regulated, through such cycles they can then allow uh, folding towards more stable states, native-like formation of structure uh, as more structural information becomes available. And then we have the downstream system of the gruel gruels which uh, is uh, always essential in E. coli in contrast to these upstream components that can be uh, deleted individually. The GROELES is always required, uh, which suggests that it is necessary for a subset of proteins to fold. And as uh, Reed has just alluded to, our early work actually was to reconstitute this pathway in vitro and it showed already that uh, some of the uh, obligate substrates apparently of GROEL uh, require or can utilize the upstream chaperone system to be stabilized against aggregation, but cannot fold with these chaperones and must be transferred to the GRUEL. Uh, we now know that their folding then proceeds inside the central cavity of the GRUEL GRUES uh, cage. And this early work already uh, suggested that these two types of chaperone system must, must be able to do very different things uh, to help a protein to fold. Now, Let's uh, revisit again the HSP70 mechanism. We heard a lot about HSP70 uh, just today uh, from, from Sebastian. I just want to briefly summarize uh, HSP70 binds to hydrophobic chain segment that are exposed in non-native proteins. It can be a nascent chain, it can be a stress denatured protein. Uh, it binds to the C-terminal segment, C-terminal peptide binding domain of, of uh, a DNAK in this case and binding and release is regulated allosterically by ATP binding and hydrolysis in the N-terminal domain. There is an alpha helical ledge segment that is open in the ATP state. It's stocked on the ATPs domain and it will close upon hydrolysis of ATP, which then creates a stably bound state in which aggregation is prevented, but in which also folding the forward reaction to the native state is, is prevented. So in order to accomplish this, we then need a nucleotide exchange factor, GRPE, in the bacterial system that uh, allows the system to cycle. It allows the release of the protein substrate from HSP70, at which it has different options. It can fold, uh, it can be transferred to a downstream chaperone, such as GRUEL, or it can also rebind and go through another uh, holding cycle. Uh, the DNHA is an important co-chaperone. We heard about this from Rina and uh, also today again. Uh, it probably in most cases binds first to the substrate and can present it to uh, HSP70. It is also a regulator of the uh, ATPs of HSP70. 
Now, uh, there are two kinds of situations in which a protein in the cell may encounter HSP70. The first, of course, is during de novo folding. We know that many nascent chains, particularly those of more uh, complex multi-domain proteins, interact with HSP70 co-translation, both in the bacterial and eukaryotic systems. Uh, and this would then um, help to support co- and post-translational folding reactions. And the other situation is for a stressed denatured protein that would uh, require HSP70 uh, for stabilization against aggregation and could, and could then refold upon a recovery from stress. Of course, as you know, HSP stands for heat shock protein. So uh, DNA, K, and many other HSP70s are strongly induced under various types of conformational stress. Now, in the work of uh, Rami Imamoglu, I want to now focus on, we used a a model substrate that has been used frequently in protein folding studies by Afly luciferase. It is an HSP70 dependent protein, both for a de novo folding and for a recovery uh, upon on stress denaturation. It's a relatively large multi domain protein with a large N terminal domain, which has a subdomain of about 20 kilodon, for which we had shown many years ago. In fact, Judith had shown this that it can fold co-translationally, and it has a smaller uh, C-terminal domain. It is a thermolabile protein, uh, which uh, makes it a very suitable uh, substrate for uh, many of the studies of in vivo protein folding, especially the effects of, of uh, conformational stress. And of course, uh, luciferase has an enormous advantage. It has an extremely sensitive luminescence assay, which almost reaches down to single molecule conditions, so it can really uh, measure folding based on its activity with very high sensitivity. Now, what uh, Arami started out here was to repeat some earlier experiments where we look at the spontaneous folding uh, of this protein from upon uh, dilution from denaturant. We used a concentration here at 100, 100 nanomolar and observed that the folding reaction was rather inefficient. This was due to aggregation. It was known that luciferase is a rather aggregation from protein. And here you can see immediately the enormous power of the HSP70 system, DNA K, DNA J, GRPE. In the presence of ATP, we observe very rapid, very efficient refolding of this luciferase protein. Now, and, and uh, obviously the aggregation reaction is, is effectively uh, avoided. But what we really wanted to know is what is the rate difference between spontaneous and uh, assisted, chaperone-assisted folding. So Rami used FCCS measurements, fluorescence cross-correlation, to determine the uh, threshold concentration at which luciferase aggregate. And he found that uh, below one nanomolar uh, luciferase in the end concentration, there was no more aggregation measurement, uh, measurable. And then he uh, performed refolding experiments under these conditions. You can see here that the refolding reaction is rather slow. It's a half time about 75 minutes. It's also only partially efficient, uh, even though there was no aggregation. This indicated that there was an equilibrium between the native state and some type of uh, folding intermediate. And also the important first conclusion was that we see a very substantial rate acceleration of folding about 20 fold. when we use the HSP70 system, compare the rate with that of spontaneous folding in the absence of aggregation. Now we did something else which uh, we found very striking uh, and which uh, in fact confirmed some earlier proposals from the De Los Rios and, and Kolubinov uh, labs, whereby he added now the DNA K system at different times to this spontaneous folding reaction. And every, in, every, in every case, this drives the protein back towards the native state, uh, suggesting that this HSP70 system can really utilize the energy of ATP uh, to shift the folding equilibrium, to drive the folding equilibrium towards the native state. And I hope to be able to uh, convince you that, that this is in fact due to a mechanism whereby the HSP70 destabilizes a misfolded uh, intermediate that is populated by the luciferase and which allows then this intermediate to be again in more rapid equilibrium with the native state. And we will see how uh, HSP70 accomplishes this. Now, in order to understand this type of misfolding, what Rami did was to use single molecule thread. He prepared various types of luciferase mutants with two cysteines to couple uh, donor and acceptor fluorophores. Uh, this is an extremely low concentration stand where we can completely exclude that we 
uh, have aggregation. So we look at monomolecular reactions exclusively. In this case, the uh, chlorophores are fairly far apart in the molecule. We have a low fat efficiency distribution. And in this construct, both fluorophores are in the large N domain, we get an intermediate fat efficiency distribution. And here they are in the smaller C domain, uh, where we get then the highest fat efficiency. Now we can use these types of uh, labeled molecules to study what happens during the folding reaction, both in the spontaneous and in the assisted folding reaction. This is now a result for the, uh, for the spontaneous folding reaction. <clears throat> Here we look at first at the denatured state in uh, guanidine, six molar guanidine. So this is the fully denatured form of luciferase. Uh, the fluorophores are in the N domain. You can see that we have an extremely low uh, fat efficiency. Apparently the polypeptide chain is in a rather expanded conformation as one might expect. If we now dilute the protein from the nature into folding buffer, uh, what Rami saw was that the uh, uh, folding reaction towards the native state fat distribution was very slow. And at early times we see uh, a very large population of folding intermediates that have actually a more compact shape, more compact distance, shorter distance between donor and acceptor, and what we see in the native state, strongly suggesting that these are misfolded uh, conformers. We uh, did a whole series of experiments, which I cannot go into detail uh, of, but which are described in the uh, paper by Rami that we published uh, not too long ago. And we concluded from this that the misfolding reaction was due to the interaction between the sub endomain and the rest of the endomain uh, in the luciferase protein. Uh, we could exclude the C domain as being a part of this. So the C domain, in fact, falls very rapidly and uh, does not contribute to this misfolding. So the, the large domain of luciferase uh, forms a misfolded state or an ensemble of misfolded states that convert very slowly towards the native state uh, and would otherwise presumably be extremely aggregation prone at higher concentrations. So how does now the HSP70 system achieve the rapid folding of this protein? Again, we use the same type of red labeled protein. And first he now looked at a state of luciferase that is bound to the DNA K, uh, DNA J system. This is done by uh, having a, a buffer solution containing these two chaperones in the presence of ATP, but in the absence of the nucleotide exchange factor. And as a result, we now form a stable complex between uh, the luciferase protein and uh, the DNA K chaperone. You can see that uh, we again see a highly expanded state. So in a way, this is somewhat akin to, uh, to what Sebastian uh, told us in, the, in this earlier uh, yeah, if, if evening you have morning uh, about other chaperones that they can in fact be having an effect um, of, a, of a type of denaturant. If we compare the, uh, the state with the luciferase in denaturant, you see that it has very similar uh, compactness, perhaps even uh, it is somewhat more expanded. And the idea why and how this is generated comes actually from earlier work of uh, Ben Schuler and Louis K. They suggested that the binding of multiple HSP70 molecules to a substrate molecule, uh, whereby uh, hydrophobic segments are relatively frequent uh, in most proteins and can be recognized that, that this creates an expanded state by a steric repulsion um, effect between the HSP70 molecules. This is not our work, but this is an explanation for what we uh, might observe here. Now, uh, when we now add the GRPE nucleotide exchange factor to initiate the folding reaction, what we saw first of all that the uh, uh, conversion to the native state is now much more rapid as expected, but nevertheless at an early time point, we again see these more compact, presumably misfolded state. And uh, based on this and other experiments, we concluded that the HSP70 cycling did not uh, prevent misfolding, but apparently it is then capable of binding to these misfolded states and converting them back via an expanded conformation um, and again releasing them that allows, in a way that allows a productive folding reaction. So HSP70 system, we believe reverts, and there is of course evidence from many other groups, reverts misfolded states, uh, in this case of the N domain of the uh, firefly luciferase protein. <clears throat> 
Now we wanted to uh, understand, however, in somewhat more detail how the HSP70 promotes folding. Uh, did it simply only bind and release and in each round uh, unfold misfolded states, expand misfolded states and give them another chance to fold? Or did it perhaps also give the molecule an, a more active push towards the native state? And in order to test this, Rami did single uh, round folding experiments where he used a high excess of an HSP70 binding peptide to, to block the HSP70 system at different stages uh, of the reaction. And, and I'm guiding you through these experiments, which are mostly control experiments and one critical experiment that comes at the end. So this is a reaction of accelerated folding by, uh, of, of luciferase by the HSP70 system, as I have shown you before, that a completely normal folding reaction. And here we let the folding reaction run for five minutes, and then Rami added this high excess of uh, uh, HSP70 binding peptide. And you can see more or less immediately uh, upon addition, the folding speed uh, changes towards the kinetics of the uh, spontaneous folding reaction. So we're losing the accelerating effect and shift the protein now into a folding reaction in the, in the bulk phase. Uh, uh, there is no aggregation in this uh, system because we work at very low concentration. Now, in this type of reaction, we add the peptide, the inhibitor peptide first to saturate the DNA KJ system uh, and then uh, allow folding to happen. And now we observe, of course, only the spontaneous phase of folding. There is no interaction with HSP7. There is some interaction with DNA J, which is not completely blocked by the peptide. That's why the folding yield here is somewhat lower. And now comes the critical experiment where we first bind luciferase to DNA KJ in the presence of ATP, then add the peptide and start the reaction with GRP. In this case, we see one round of release of luciferase from the chaperones, but there is no rebinding. And now we get a biphasic reaction with a fast phase and a slower phase that resembles the spontaneous kinetics, suggesting that, and this corresponds to approximately 18% or so, of the total luciferase that uh, in the course of the release, a fraction of luciferase molecules is allowed to fold much faster towards the native state. So the answer actually of the, to the question was, uh, yes, there is an active component whereby the HSP70 provides a, a push towards the luciferase for a fraction of molecules. They are now allowed to uh, avoid formation of this kinetically trapped state. And this, we believe, is the actual mechanism uh, that underlies this uh, substantial rate acceleration that we observe. To summarize this, so we believe that uh, luciferase has a strong tendency to form these misfolded states within the end domain, uh, both upon in vitro refolding, of course, but also, as we have shown, upon heat denaturation, uh, mimicking stress conditions, and presumably also to some extent, at least, during uh, co-translational uh, folding. The HSP70 system recognizes this uh, domain, this misfolded state, expands it, and upon GRP-dependent release allows it now to partition uh, back towards the misfolded state or to the native state. But the release reaction is not simply the same as a dilution from denaturant. Uh, it allows a fraction of the molecules to circumvent to fall back into this misfolded state, to circumvent this misfolding reaction and proceed much faster towards the native state. And this is uh, basically how the uh, system, the HSP70 system, utilizes the ATP to promote a folding reaction. It brings this misfolded protein in much more rapid equilibrium with the native state. Now, what about the GROWE LES system? As I mentioned before, uh, in contrast to HSP70, we uh, always require grow LES for growth, indicating that there is a specific subset of proteins that are strongly or uh, obligatorily dependent on this particular chaperone. And how can we now understand what is grow LES doing different from these upstream chaperones? What is the difference in the basic mechanism? Now there has been a lot of work done on been done on this system. I have mentioned here a couple of people who have made major contributions over the years. Of course, there are lots, lots more labs that have been uh, working with this system. As Judy's already explained, this is another example of a 
uh, double ring uh, complex, chaperonin complex. In this case, it's a homo oligomer. It's a simpler version compared to the trig CCT. There are seven 60 kilodalton subunits. There are not eight, but seven subunits in each ring. And these subunits expose hydrophobic regions on their apical domains that then capture a partially folded state, for example, upon transfer from the HSP-70. A little bit similar to binding uh, to a fly, uh, a glue trap or something like that. This causes generally uh, unfolding global destabilization of the molecule. Now we had uh, seen that in E. coli, about 250 different cytosolic proteins could be identified uh, as substrates of this system. And, and among these, uh, we and also the uh, Taguchi lab showed that there is a subset of obligate substrates uh, which can only utilize glue LES for folding. They will not be able to use the HSP70 system, for example. Now, the way these proteins fold, uh, we believe, requires the encapsulation uh, of the protein inside the chamber of the chaperonin, similar to the chamber of, of the trick that uh, Judith has described. In this case, the glue ES is a separate lid factor that binds to the ends of the glue L uh, double ring. And when this happens in an ATP dependent reaction, uh, this causes major conformational changes or is associated with such changes in the glue L system, whereby these hydrophobic regions are now being buried in the interface between the subunits and the interior of this chamber becomes highly hydrophilic and net negatively charged. It is now conducive to uh, allow a folding reaction. At the same time, of course, uh, aggregation is prevented. Uh, during the time frame, the polypeptide spends in this chamber a couple of seconds that are required for the hydrolysis of the seven ATP molecules uh, in the uh, glue ES bound ring. This is also a highly allosteric system with positive cooperativity of ATP binding and hydrolysis with hindering and negative uh, allosteric between the rings. The binding of ATP then to the opposite ring uh, causes the release of ligands from the third, first ring, opening of the chamber, and folded substrate can emerge. If folding has not gone to completion, then uh, the substrate body can be recaptured and it can go through another round of folding inside this cage. Uh, this can be repeated multiple times, but we have seen that the obligate substrates, as far as we could study them, uh, seem to all be very efficiently utilizing this system. In fact, uh, we believe now that in addition to preventing aggregation, a major function of the system, in fact, is to uh, catalyze folding, to accelerate folding of proteins uh, towards the native state. And the proteins that seem to be uh, benefiting from this specialized folding environment provided by the chaperone cage are often uh, having a particular structure, domain structure, the beta alpha 18 barrel structure. This is the most enriched fold among the obligate substrates. We have a, a central beta barrel of hydrophobic beta sheets surrounded by amphiphilic helices. And the important thing about these structures is that uh, these are relatively large complex domains which are stabilized by many long range interactions. Uh, because of their size, uh, and this has been shown by theoretical simulation, uh, hydrophobic collapse uh, may be insufficient in uh, restricting the conformational space that must be searched by the protein uh, towards the folding to the native state. And as a result, uh, many of these proteins seem to uh, populate uh, dynamic folding intermediates that are separated from the native state by uh, entropic energy barriers, rather than by uh, actual misfolding within the chain, as we had seen by the firefly luciferase. And uh, we believe that the glue el chamber uh, solves the folding problem of these proteins by, in fact, a, to first approximation at least, by an effect of sterically confining the protein inside the cage and pushing it into the cage. Obviously, this is where the um, energy of ATP would be consumed. Uh, so we believe that the cage then uh, restricts the conformation for freedom of the enclosed chain. It will uh, enhance hydrophobic collapse. And this is supported by further features of the cage, in particular the net negative charge of the inner surface. We also heard about the charge of the trick surface, which seems to be bipartite. In this case, we have a more homogeneous negative charge. 
And there are also flexible sea terminal tails uh, emanating from the Groel subunits into the, uh, into the cage. They have low complexity uh, repeat sequences and uh, it has been shown that the presence of these tails also plays a role in accelerated fall. And this is uh, how you could imagine a folded substrate protein inside the cage. And obviously uh, the unfolded state would be more expanded. So you can immediately see that there is really not much space left when the protein is encapsulated. Now, here is an example of such a protein called dub a a tin barrel protein, uh, E. coli protein, which is an obligate substrate. Uh, we studied it because in this case, we can actually measure the spontaneous folding rate. It does not ag aggregate at lower concentrations, but we see that now uh, the growy LES system uh, massively uh, accelerates folding 20 to 30 times and there are other conditions at higher temperature where this rate acceleration is even uh, more pronounced. Now, importantly, when we try to fold this protein with the HSP70 system, we observe what we had seen earlier on, that now in fact the folding rate is decelerated. This is much slower than the spontaneous folding rate. This is the rate of spontaneous folding. And any time during this reaction, we are now adding Gruyeles. We see transfer to Gruyel from the HSP70 and very rapid completion of folding towards the native state. So the HSP70 system has an important role in the folding of these proteins. It stabilizes them against aggregation, keeps them in a folding competent state, but their folding is not mediated efficiently. This would not be a folding speed that is of biological relevance. And here's another more recent example of an even more dramatic catalysis of folding by the Gruel system protein called METF, which is also a tin barrel protein like dub a it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tetrameric protein. It was known that uh, upon disassembly and unfolding, uh, the refolding is, I mean, this is, this is an irreversible reaction as shown by uh, Günther et al. And when the dimer dissociates FAD, a cofactor bound cofactor dissociates this results then in an unfolded monomer, which is uh, highly unstable and cannot return towards the native state. You can see the reaction uh, of spontaneous folding. There is no, no refolding uh, upon dilution from, uh, from denaturant, but a very efficient refolding uh, with the Gruy LES system again is achieved. And in fact, this protein is now unable to fold spontaneously even at uh, single molecule conditions where we could completely rule out aggregation. So it forms a really uh, stable obstinate folding intermediate that does not want to convert for hours at least uh, towards the native state. But as we keep the protein at low concentration, we can now add growy LES at any time and obtain exactly this type of accelerated uh, folding. And the folding reaction is extremely efficient with about 50% of the molecules achieving native state upon a single round of encapsulation. Now, one more question that was of interest to uh, Amit Singh, who did these experiments, was whether encapsulation of this protein in the Gruyere S cage actually results in a stably folded METF subunit. I told you that we cannot generate this folded subunit uh, in the spontaneous folding reaction. Uh, what he did was to use the technique that Rachel Clavitt had introduced, hydrogen deuterium exchange, and also Sebastian, I believe, mentioned this. This is a, a very nice uh, biophysical technique to measure conformational stability of proteins. Uh, we, uh, it's based on the idea that, that uh, hydrogen amide, uh, amides, uh, hydrogens that are not involved in stable secondary tertiary structure can be exchanged by uh, deuterium. Uh, this needs, leads to a, uh, an increase in the mass of the protein. We can quench this exchange reaction at low pH and with pepsin digest and uh, mass spectrometry <clears throat> then measure the amount of deuterium that was uh, incorporated. This can be done for different times. And then we can compare different conformation states. And this <coughs> is what Rami did, uh, excuse me, Amit did that for both the uh, gro -E bound state, the encapsulated state, uh, and also for the native state. Here is the result for the native state. Uh, this tetramer is highly stable. As expected, we see very low deuterium incorporation into the native structure of the protein. However, upon binding to Gruel, and this has been shown uh, 
by others for different substrate proteins before. Um, upon binding, the protein is highly destabilized. It is bound upon dilution from the nature and it is stabilized in a, a globally uh, unfolded state. And uh, please note that this is now showing the difference in incorporation between the native state and the gruel bound state. But strikingly, the encapsulated protein has a stability, and this is now the single encapsulated subunit, very similar to that of the assembled uh, native um, MEDF protein. So the, uh, the GROEL cage apparently is capable, capable of not only allowing the folding of this protein, but it also then provides a, an environment that keeps the subunit stable, except for regions in the strong interface between the subunits, which only become stabilized uh, upon assembly. Uh, and this is, of course, a very nice internal control that we actually are looking at the encapsulated protein. So uh, to summarize, uh, what I have tried to tell you is that we believe there are two basic mechanisms by which these ATP-dependent chaperone systems, HSP70 system and the GROEL chaperonin can actively promote folding reactions and they address folding problems by different subsets uh, of proteins in, in the proteome. The HSP70 system deals, uh, in, as we showed, for the luciferase protein for larger multi-domain proteins in many cases that form misfolded states uh, it can expand these misfolded states by binding to hydrophobic regions that are exposed in them. Um, and then presumably in a mechanism of stepwise HSP70 release, we obtain a productive folding reaction towards the native state that can be faster than the spontaneous reaction. Uh, we have observed, of course, that multiple HSP70 bind to a luciferase molecule, and this is probably what uh, causes the expansion. Uh, and then there is uh, uh, this stepwise release, that's our hypothesis, that uh, explains uh, how the system allows a fraction of the molecules to circumvent uh, the uh, fall, falling back into this misfolded state. Now, the GROEL system, we believe, is more specialized to proteins that in which the folding problem is dominated by um, by the formation of a population of dynamic folding intermediates uh, and by encapsulating these proteins in a confining environment, it allows these proteins to reach the native uh, state faster. It, it shortens the search time uh, necessary within these dynamic folding intermediates uh, towards the native state. The both systems are coupled. Uh, generally, uh, proteins during synthesis are first given a chance to interact with the HSP70 system and those that are utilizing the system successfully, of course, would not go on to GROEL, but others can be transferred to the downstream acting uh, GROEL machinery. And this is what we observe for these obligate uh, substrates, um, for which I have shown you some examples. Both systems function by destabilizing folding intermediates relative to the uh, transition state, but uh, do not change the uh, stability of the native state. And uh, that's basically what I wanted to uh, talk about today. And I'm very happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot again for inviting me to participate. Thank you very much, Ulrich, for a, a wonderful study on uh, protein folding in vitro. And I, I didn't realize that actually the uh, C-terminal IDRs of GRL are disordered. And I think that's a, a bit of a theme we've been seeing today and yesterday also with Johannes's disordered C-terminal region of P23 and the disordered tail of um, HSP70, the EEVD motif that Rena showed. So um, some interesting, interesting yeah. general features of chaperone. It's an coming. important point. And of course there are uh, low complexity sequences, for example, in some of the HSP40s that Rena talked but, about. But of course, uh, yes. Yeah, it's it's yeah, certainly, uh, is quite uh, prevalent in chaperones to have these uh, flexible regions. And, and also, of course, the, the gates on the proteasome. But uh, we have a lot of questions here, so I'll start with one from David Agard at UCSF. Um, and he writes here that the Wickner and Rudiger laboratories and others have shown that HSP90 synergistically works with HSP70 to facilitate luciferase folding. Yes. And within your model, would HSP90 increase the yield or facilitate the recapture of luciferase or maybe something else? Uh, we have actually tried to uh, 
do this in our system, we didn't see a very strong effect, but uh, it may depend on the ratios of the different chaperones and how much chaperone you have relative to luciferase. Uh, in most of the single molecule experiments, of course, we have relatively high excess of HSP70. But I assume that the HSP90 uh, plays a role perhaps in, uh, in, it might perhaps enhance the ability of the HSP70 system to uh, produce a productive folding intermediate and, and uh, prevent uh, luciferase to fall back into this misfolded state. Uh, Clearly, of course, the HSP70 and the HSP90 system can also cooperate. And uh, in the eukaryotic system, this is, is implemented even uh, by components that form a linker between the two systems. And I'll also add uh, one more forgotten chapter on the peptidyl prolyl isomerase that can isomerize cisproline that might be present in the unfolded state. Hmm. Um, we have another question from Fabrizio Chiti from the University of Florence. Um, for the mechanism that you described, is the effect of the DNAK grip E cycle on the misfolded state of luciferase a thermodynamic destabilization, or is it a kinetic effect, or maybe some combination of both? I would say it's a kinetic effect we, because the, the chaperone does not bind to the native state of luciferase, but it uh, allows a folding intermediate to convert to the native state. And this is a kinetically trapped folding intermediate. I should have also mentioned that uh, obviously it will be important to see to what extent the eukaryotic chaperone system, uh, which would be the one that actually interacts with luciferase physiologically, uh, does something similar or uh, whether we find differences. And of course, it is quite conceivable that the uh, additional complexity of the HSP70 system in eukaryotes, especially with regard to the HSP40 components, uh, may, uh, may be of interest in this context and see whether uh, we find differences compared to the uh, perhaps more simple uh, prokaryotic system. And uh, great that you mentioned the HSP40 because we have a question here also from Asif Ali, the University of Chicago. Uh, do you think that HSP40s or J proteins may be the ones that facilitate the so-called decision making on the transferring of substrates to grow EL, grow ES? Or, or how is that substrate specificity conferred? Well, that's, that is a, an, an important question. Um, I don't think we have any evidence that the uh, HSP40 plays a role in this context. It seems to be critical, obviously, for the binding of substrates to uh, the HSP70. Uh, what makes the difference why a protein, I mean, we see that obviously the folding intermediates that are generated by these proteins have very high affinity for the GRUEL system. Uh, and this allows the more or less unidirectional transfer from HSP70 to, uh, to GRUEL. So we would assume that this must have something to do with the properties of these uh, folding intermediates, which probably expose uh, relatively large hydrophobic surfaces, perhaps uh, similar to what one might find in a state that has initially been originally been described as the molten globule. And in some of our earliest work, we could actually uh, use some of the criteria for the molten globule and saw that the GLOEL bound state uh, was quite similar in that respect, for example, with regard to ANS binding and so on. Thank you. And maybe one more question from Andrew Savinov, the University of Washington. Um, he's interested if maybe you could comment on the relative roles or importance of GROEL's um, ATP-driven unfolding of the misfolded states versus the entropic confinement yes. uh, that it provides. Obviously, there is, a, I mean, I did say that when, when the substrate binds to GROEL, we do see um, a global destabilization of the molecule. Uh, this would also be the same, of course, or similar in the HSP70 bound state, but uh, it is quite conceivable that uh, an unfolding reaction upon binding to GRUEL would set the protein up to benefit uh, in an in a optimal way from the confining space into which it, it, it then becomes encapsulated. Uh, it is uh, experimentally not trivial to uh, distinguish between these contributions. What we do know is clearly that the encapsulation is critical because that is a state that we can, uh, we can uh, repair, we can stabilize it, we can look at it without 
repeated binding to the growy L apical domain. So we can, we can make a stable encapsulated state and show that the rate of folding is the same as, if the, as when the protein is allowed to bind and cycle through the system. But we can never uh, avoid a single round of binding to grow L, which may make a contribution. Uh, so, uh, because this is the only way we can actually introduce the protein into the chamber. We have been thinking about some other ways and we, we might be able to do this. Uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, goes really to the heart of the mechanism. But uh, generally, I would say uh, there is no reason to assume that both mechanisms could not cooperate. Thank you. Yeah, and fascinating. And I, I look forward to seeing some more work on, on trying to dissect that mechanism. Um, thank you for all of our attendees for, for joining us. Thank you very much for all of our presenters, both today and yesterday, for giving us such wonderful presentations. Um, and I look forward to the next Protein Society webinar, uh, whenever that may be. Uh, lots of questions or not? Is it possible to study the folding reactions, kinetics in cells or in cells free lysate? I yeah, I guess with the single molecule approach, or you have fluorescently labeled protein, I wonder if, if that could be done in, in indeed cell lysates. Or... Yes, I mean, there is, of course, uh, there are now ways of looking at single molecules in cells. Uh, it's not trivial, perhaps, to study folding reactions, but, but certainly one can look at uh, chaperone interactions. Uh, and but what we and others, of course, have done is to use in vitro translation systems uh, to study folding, which is which is a lot closer to the in vivo situation than uh, diluting a protein from the nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and in such a reaction, you could then perhaps also use uh, certain tagged proteins that allow uh, fluorescent labeling and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be also very fascinating. Yeah. I see here also Fabrizio followed up. He, he writes here that he understands DNA kit does not destabilize the native state, but what about the misfolded state? Does the whole yeah, cycle- it certainly dis It certainly destabilizes the misfolded state because the misfolded state seems to be a compact intermediate, which then becomes a very expanded state, uh, dimension-wise, as far as we can tell, uh, of, of a similar dimension to that state in denaturant. But we cannot uh, at this point exclude that it still contains substantial uh, secondary structure, perhaps even native-like secondary structure. It, uh, interesting you mentioned that. It's very similar to Lewis's beautiful work on HSP70, where they showed the tertiary contacts are effectively abolished as exactly. in denaturing, but th yeah. there is, they see native-like secondary structure. And this so might be also one reason why the release from HSP70 is not identical with the step of diluting the protein from denaturant. Exactly, yeah. So thank you again, Reed. It was really, I mean, I learned a lot in this, uh, in this seminar series. There's a question from someone in Tanzania. I don't think anyone, I've never had a student or a colleague from Africa asking me about GROEL and chaperones. So peptides that are evolutionary conserved within a protein for example, in enzyme are usually regarded as critical for function. Would you surmise that some conserved resin may be related instead to critical interactions? Certainly a good idea. Uh, we have spoken about the possibility that chaperones and their substrates have co-evolved. Uh, so it is, it's very conceivable that there is adaptation. A uh, very nice example actually is uh, a protein that uh, managed in higher heart studies, the uh, protein Rubisco which is the most abundant protein, which is a, it's an obligate chaperone in substrate. Uh, and interestingly, the plant Rubisco, which is inside chloroplast, needs to utilize the plant chloroplast chaperone in for folding, which is actually quite similar to Gruyel, but it cannot utilize the bacterial Gruyel. We don't know exactly why that is, but it certainly reflects a level of adaptation uh, to the cognate uh, chaperone system uh, by the substrate. Uh, also, there has been wonderful work uh, 
to show uh, that chaperones can buffer mutations uh, in proteins uh, and thereby enhance or support the evolution of new protein functions, perhaps. Uh, there is a work from, from an Israeli group. I, I'm, I'm uh, escape in name. Uh, of name course, the Sue, uh, Sue Linquist group. And Sue uh, Linquist they, is yeah, the other the for that. person uh, for the HSP70 system. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's very, for example, when you uh, take a stable protein and induce, introduce mutations, as we and others have done for the maltose binding protein, just as a model, you render this protein at some point uh, GLUE LES dependent, whereas the wild type protein falls perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the mutant protein now requires the chaperone. And in the absence of chaperone, this mutant protein would not be able to realize its functional state. Mm -hmm. But in the presence of the chaperone, it reaches its functional state and it could thereby become subject to. Uh, Darwinian evolution and selection based on its functional guide here. This is how we imagine uh, a chaperones may have played a role in protein evolution. There may be a, a period of, could be a very long period, I assume, whereby this mutant protein is chaperone dependent, but then secondary mutations may, acqui may be acquired that make the protein again more robust in terms of its folding pathway. And this is probably uh, more likely the case for very abundant and essential proteins. And in this regard, the Rubisco protein is actually the most striking exception because not only is it abundant, it is probably the most abundant protein and it is completely uh, chaperone dependent and has not been able to escape this trap, wow. this evolutionary trap. It would be very interesting to do some sort of a directed evolution experiment to take an obligate chaperone dependent exactly. protein folder and, yeah. and make, turn it into a, no longer dependent on the chaperone. Yeah, the name of the Israeli scientist is Taufik and he did the best work for uh, demonstrating that uh, the glue el system can buffer uh, mutations and thereby uh, support protein evolution. Yeah, the co-evolution of chaperone and substrate I think is a, a very interesting field and, and it's related to Paul's findings there with the TIM chaperones, the TIM, inter the binding interface is of course conserved, but I wonder then if, if indeed the interaction TIM and its substrates, if there has been some co-evolution for those, those recognition sites. Yeah, it's a possibility. We, we, we still have a lot of uh, questions to be Just quickly, addressed. Lucio yeah. Luzata noted that uh, you were you guys were together at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, but he said now he's in Tanzania. Ah, okay, excellent. So, uh, is it possible to answer some of these questions also tomorrow, or will they be will they disappear? I think they will disappear. Um, maybe um, maybe they can email in which you proportion the HSP seven. This has this you can take from the published literature. Uh, that's all described about what, what, uh, how much of which chaperone. Uh, do we know if only a single molecule of substrate? Yeah, only a single molecule of uh, substrate seems to become encapsulated. And interestingly, I should have mentioned this the firefly luciferase cannot utilize Chloe LES for folding. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could easily imagine why this is the case because now you enforce, in fact, that this is our way of interpreting this. We now enforce by encapsulating it. It is just at the limit of what can be encapsulated size-wise. But you, now, you would now enforce this misfolding event by, by putting it in this confining environment. Uh, because now you get uh, misfolding between the uh, different subdomains. Uh, but that is not the case, obviously, for those proteins that have adapted to make use of the confining environment. So uh, it's, it's, you can easily reach very difficult, uh, very different or perhaps incorrect conclusions by, by using or by looking at the wrong substrate. And th there must be a size limit for the cage because- It's th approximately 60 kilodalton or so, yeah. but it depends a bit on the shape of a protein, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how to ensure that the stoichiometry of, of, of uh, chaperones and substrate is the same as in the cell. Obviously, that's uh, not easy to do. We, we, don't, uh, we don't claim that we can uh, 
really say that this is exactly how everything works in the cell. Yeah. Thank you for noting that, Paul. I, what I, just I would like to suggest to those people who I haven't answered the question, whose question I have not, why don't you send me an email with your question and I will be happy to answer it. It is now 8.30 here and my wife has prepared a wonderful dinner, which we will have now. And I thank you all for your interest and uh, I will answer the questions when you send it to me by email. Thank you very much, Ulrich, and enjoy the dinner. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, I, I see those people with their hands up. I'm not sure if they can be enabled to speak. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. Their hands are up. So I, I think now they can be, um, if Mirella Bucci or, or Subranil Gosh can unmute themselves, I think, I think you can be free to chat. Oh, apologies. I don't have any questions. Sorry. Uh, that's OK. I think though we can save the uh, questions in the chat that were directed for Ulrich and we can email those to him and maybe he can email out uh, his responses in a general email to the, uh, the registrants of the, the webinar. Thank you, Paul and Sebastian also, of course, for staying on. I realize it's also 8.30 PM in Europe. Yeah. I don't have a, I don't have a dinner ready. <laughs> I first yeah. have to call.